Good evening. I call the Planning Commission meeting to order. It is now 6.30, Thursday, December 13th. We're located here in City Hall at the City of Sammamish Council Chambers. Welcome. The first item on our agenda tonight is the well, call to order. So I'll start on my left tonight. Sorry, Roisin. <laughs> Roisin O'Farrell. Mark Boffman. Ritu Jain Dapure. Shanna Collins. Eric Brooks. Jane Garrison. So we have six commissioners present tonight. We're missing one commissioner, that's Larry Crandall, uh, due to a medical appointment, I'll just say that. And the next item on the business is the approval of the agenda. I move to approve the agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. And the agenda is approved unanimously. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from December 6, 2018. So moved. I have an oh. amendment, sir. Yeah. I think. Uh, is fair and Pierce spelled right? I think it says fair and fears. <laughs> <laughs> Let me look real quick. Is that right? Fair. It's not fair and peers. It says P, it says F-E-E-R-S. Yeah, I don't think that's right. Is that right? Okay, so we'll fix that. Oh, yeah. Um, just make a motion, Jane, to make that amendment. I move we correct the spelling of peers. Second. There's a motion and a second to make the amendment to change fair and peers to, or fair and fears to fair and peers, <laughs> and of course, anywhere that appears in the document. Um, so when we're voting, let's just vote on approving the agenda with that amendment. So all those in favor are, I think I already said there's a motion and a second, did I? Mm -hmm. yes. How about this? There's a motion and a second to make the correction and approve the meeting minutes from December 6th. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no and the minutes are approved as amended. So the next item on the agenda is public comment, and this is the non-agenda section of the public comment. Anyone who'd like to speak would have three minutes to speak, um, five minutes if you're an organization. Our item tonight, our only item tonight is the development regulations, so if you'd like to speak on anything other than that, you're welcome to come up to the podium. Anybody? No? Okay, public comment is closed, so we'll move on to our agenda item for the night, which is old business, and this is the development regulations update workshop. Um, we had a chance this week, I, I don't know if all of us did, but a few of us maybe had a chance to speak with David Pyle, who's sitting right here, Deputy Director of Community Development, and we went through sort of this focus group list of questions related to the interim development regulations and had a chance to kind of give some of our thoughts and hopes, comments, solutions, problems, all that sort of stuff related to the development regulations. So tonight, we're going to hear from David and possibly Sarah, um, kind of an update on the actual focus group itself and what those folks had to say. And then we'll also, they're going to walk us through the same presentation that they gave to the focus group so that they can get an, an idea of how we feel about the development regulations, sort of some of our just gut reactions. Tonight is not really about the weeds, it's just about, you know, our, all of the regulations that we want to look at there, or are they not there? Are they ones that we'd, they'd like to take off the table, put back on the table? Um, those are the kind of, that's the kind of feedback uh, they're looking for for tonight. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Pyle. Uh, thank you, Chair Collins. Um, David Pyle, Department of Community Development. Um, <clears throat> so um, thank you for the good introduction on the issue. Um, we're here tonight uh, as a follow-up to a meeting that we held last week with um, various members of the community. We'll get into that here in a little more detail. Um, so we're trying to make sure I have the system set. So, oh, there we go. Um, so <clears throat> um, 
so far working on this um, project are myself, um, Sarah, uh, Jeff Thomas, and many of the other members of the department have been working in supporting this effort. Um, well, by way of, uh, we'll see if this works, by way of um, some background, uh, the development code and zoning controls update is something that was identified back in 2017 as part of the city's um, budget planning effort and work planning effort. Um, it was added to the budget and we were given direction to uh, begin the process of performing background research and to bring it out into um, the formal uh, legislative process to start in the fall of 2018. <clears throat> in the, uh, the, the summer of 2018, after we had embarked on some of the background research, um, we were asked by some members of the city council with regard to what, how the progress was going, uh, what we'd learned, um, and um, what types of code changes could be made. Um, that translated into a um, emergency ordinance that was passed on September 18th of 2018, um, which is good for six months and put in place some interim development regulations. Um, that was passed through ordinance 2018-468. Uh, at um, the same time, a public hearing was scheduled for November 6th of 2018. Um, and we came to the Planning Commission in October of 2018 and presented those changes that were passed through the interim development regulations. A public hearing was held, <coughs> excuse me, on, on November 6th of 2018, a few weeks ago, um, where the City Council made some adjustments to the interim development regulations um, by passing of Ordinance uh, 2018-4017, or excuse me, 471. Um, at that point, um, it, it directed the staff, they, they also directed the staff to begin the legislative process of considering permanent development regulation changes. Uh, the interim development regulations by way of um, emergency ordinance expire six months after their passing. So that would be March of 2019. So the direction that we received was to make every effort possible to get through the legislative process before the interim development regulations expire in March of 2019. So here we are tonight to officially start the legislative process with the Planning Commission regarding um, potential permanent changes to the city's interim development regulate, or excuse me, the, the city's development regulations. Are there any questions about that timeline? I don't have a question about the timeline, but I just have a question about the scope. Um, so with the, the, the ordinances or the, the municipal codes that we'll be looking at right now are very specific. Uh, and then this work that was planned out, was that a revamp of the whole chapter or, you know, chapter 21? Or, uh, so I'm just trying to understand, you know, will we have to go back to chapter 21 and look at each of the chapters next year or whenever it comes up? And will that also, again, will we have to address what we're addressing right now again? Yeah, great question. So when this was added to the department's work plan and added to the budget, um, it was envisioned as a two-part process. The first stage um, of that process was to be uh, consideration of uh, adjustments to the city's zoning controls. So when I say zoning controls, I'm talking about the, the regulations that affect the form of development, setbacks, building height, lot coverage, density. Um, it's the full range of those regulations in our code that control development in the city. Um, the one way to think about development regulations or zoning controls is in terms of levers and dials. Um, a, a, a control can be set, for example, a setback so that you have a five foot setback, a 10 foot setback, a 15 foot setback, and that dial can be adjusted to generate a certain outcome. Um, if you increase the setback, it's going to increase the, re the land requirements for construction of homes. It's going to change the separation between homes. It's going to change the look and feel of how something fits in the community. Um, there are impacts to development that are associated with the, those changes, but there are also potentially beneficial things that could result from those changes. So it's about a discussion on balance here um, and what is appropriate for the city. Um, and we'll get into that here with this presentation. 
so phase one was always intended to be um, the, the hard discussion, if you will, around which zoning controls are appropriate for the city, what is the right calibration or setting for those zoning controls, and w what are we missing in our code in terms of um, controlling the broader form of development here in the city. Uh, phase two was always intended to be a, a rewrite of the development regulations, and we have a code that we inherited from King County and has been patched several times. There are sections of the code that are complex and difficult to read because of the patching that's occurred. There's inconsistencies with references, old references that go to nowhere. There's sentences in occasion that, that stop abruptly that where you think there might be some words missing or needed. Um, there's also a change in technology um, in the code is a fairly old code, but the d development industry has changed quite a bit. We see uh, the use of different types of technologies now. A good example of that is some of the code language around the use of stormwater uh, facilities for recreation space. Our code doesn't did not contemplate that development would be regularly using vaults instead of ponds today, and that you might be able to put recreation space on top of a concrete vault lid um, and the code is a little confused around how that works. So that would be an example of a code drafting effort where we would clean that up. The idea there is that you would unpack the code um, and park all of the technical or regulatory items, and then you would reassemble the code by redrafting it and, in, and ensure that all of those technical or regulatory items are accounted for when you redraft it. Many cities have gone through this effort. Um, typically, it leads to what is known as a, um, a, a unified development code, um, and it leads to a code that, that reads a lot better than something that's been repaired a few times. So with regard to the legislative process, um, here we are on December 13th. This is uh, the Planning Commission workshop on the development regulations, phase one of the development regulations. Um, and you can see how we've laid out uh, the work plan here, uh, where we'll be meeting again with the Planning Commission in January. Uh, we'll be moving on to the City Council um, and then working with the City Council to address any of their concerns or needs and how that might need to be, how the proposed changes might need to be adjusted. Um, just as a little bit of background, um, I'm going to be presenting to you three tables in the next three slides that demonstrate a snapshot of how development regulations in the city have changed. Um, this is a table snapshot from 2013. Um, one really good example is to, to identify with how things have been changed with the interim regs and over time is to look at the, the setback requirements. So you might see here that there are uh, two lines on this uh, table, minimum street setback and minimum interior setback. So back in 2013, um, we had a street setback in the R4 of 10 feet, and we had an interior setback of five feet. So that regulation would result in a home that could be placed on a lot with five feet on the sides and rear and 10 feet in the front. Um, so, you could build a house um, of a certain size that would fit. One of the other controls that's important to take into account is the impervious surface control, because in that case, you wouldn't be able to build a home that is bigger than 55%, um, but you would also have to account for uh, driveways, patios, sidewalks, and all those things as well that are impervious. So those are other zoning controls that, that will direct the outcome of a development. Um, now, this, now realize that there's a really important thing, I think this was part of our focus group realization on the part of some of the, the members of the community that real, they realize this, is that um, development in, in subdivisions particularly are, are given a, a high degree of protection under state law with regard to vesting or grandfathering to regulations. So when a, a developer puts forward the effort to assemble a, an application for subdivision, they go through the process of acquiring contract for land, they hire engineers to do the design work, um, and then they put together a, a complete application package. The Washington State Legislature see, saw that they should be afforded some degree of protection 
so that a city or a county um, or other agency doesn't turn around and change their rules on them after they've gone through that effort. So what they've done is they've passed uh, subdivision vesting rules that are found in the Revised Code of Washington, specifically the Revised Code of Washington section 58.17.170 um, is one such example. I would suggest taking a read of that in your spare time. Um, and and what, what that does is it, it says that, um, and that it, it basically creates a life cycle of a subdivision project that could last, depending on mo many circumstances, so there's different timelines that we operate on within that larger timeline, but a subdivision could live for about up to 15 years on its largest, on its longest time cycle. So it's important to note here that these are 2013 regulations and many of the subdivisions that we are seeing being built today and finishing up today were based on these regulations. Uh, there were also some changes made in 2016 to the development regulations and also to some of the partner regulations, which were the city's stormwater rules and the city's public work standards. So one thing to note is, is that the divisions that were that were pushed through permitting based on those revised standards largely have not been built today. So we're just seeing those come to come to construction now. So we are not we haven't really seen the outcome of some of those changes that were made um, back in 2016 in terms of development regulation adjustments, in terms of stormwater rules and in terms of um, public work standards adjustments. So road width requirements um, and all those things that go along with that. So one thing to note here is that compared to the 2013 regulations, uh, the, the setbacks are different. So in this case, in the R4, you still have 10 feet of street setbacks. So in the front, there's 10 feet of setback required. However, on the interior, instead of just five feet all around, we, we've gone to five, seven, and 15. And what that does is it allows some flexibility based on design needs to move a home around on a piece of property um, and to provide some additional setbacks. So we, we're seeing additional spatial requirements for subdivisions. Note also that the impervious surface uh, requirement in the R4 was removed and it was replaced with a minimum yard area requirement. Um, the lot coverage requirement, I believe, remains the same. We just didn't show that on the previous slide. So there are other zoning controls at play with regard to how big a house can be on a piece of property. Um, these, we should start to see homes being constructed, I would guess, in 2019, 2020. Some of the first projects will make it to home construction, where we'll start to see the homes be built and we'll start to see how the 5, 7, and 15-foot interior setback um, affects development. The 2018 interim development regulations, if you look at the street setback and the side set, what we are now calling side setback, so the pr previously interior setback. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of things that occur with the interim development regulations. One is that um, we changed how we define interior setback and we changed it to side and rear. Um, and that was more in tune with, with traditional forms of development where you have a front yard, a rear yard, and a side yard. Um, it's easier for us to um, review permits and understand patterns. And we regularly have many comments from neighbors around why don't they have a rear yard? Their house is five feet from my backyard. Um, shouldn't they have a backyard that abuts my backyard and provides for some additional separation? Those types of comments. So in a more traditional sense of development, having a, a front, which we're still calling the street, having side setbacks and having a rear setback is something that affords that type of protection to a neighbor that's there. Um, and it provides separations and patterns that are different than the five foot interior or the five, seven and 15 interior. Um, so one other change was that the street setback was increased. So in this case in the R4, whereas we had um, 10 previously, it went to 20 with the initial passing of the interim development regulations on September 18th under ordinance 468. 
And then on November 6th, as part of the public hearing, the city council decided to turn the dial. So if you think of development regulations and a dial, they turned the dial back, in this case, with R4 to 15 feet um, of, of street setback. So um, in, addition, in addition to that, they turned the dial back on the side yard setbacks to 20 feet. Now, with these tables, it's important to note that there are these footnotes in here, um, the numbers 5, 11 that are in the parenthesis. Um, those numbers are really important. Um, the, 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 the details matter in the case of applying this type of table. So with regard to the side yard setbacks, you'll see that in the R4, it's listed as 20 feet. Well, that is also subject to the application of um, footnote 2, 12, and 17 as per the table. So in this case, if you were to read through those footnotes, you would see that, in fact, what this is saying is that it's 20 feet of aggregate setback, total setback on the sides, with a minimum of seven and a half. So what that does is it says that you have to have seven and a half on one side, and that the other side could be the balance. Or you could have 10 and 10, or you could have seven and a half and 12 and a half. Um, you could have eight and 12. Um, it just depends on how you, it allows some flexibility in moving the home to either side to avoid things like required protected trees, to provide access, those types of things. Um, so there were a whole host of other changes that were made as part of the initial interim regs and then the adjustments through the November uh, 6th ordinance. And we'll get into those here as we walk through this. But this just gives you some background over um, some of the major generational changes that occurred in the timeline of the city's development regulations. And hopefully that gives an a little bit of background on why when we see things being built and when we continue to see things being built um, under older rules like the 2013 rules, why they're being built and look that way even though they're being built in say 2020 or 2022. It's because state law protects those projects for the life cycle of the project up to a certain number of years. And you had mentioned on the phone call that you know today's trend is though that, that, that the subdivisions are done and they're kind of built out pretty quickly. So one wouldn't necessarily see some build out still happening 15 years from now, but the point's still well you know, still taken. What, what we would instead see as a likely scenario is um, a builder will decide, will go through the preliminary plat process, receive the protections, and then they'll slowly meter out that development. They'll build the infrastructure, they'll get, they'll record it, and then they'll eventually build the homes. You're, you're correct that we do not see as frequently as we may have used to see homes be built one at a time, slowly in a division. Usually they'll build out the whole division within a year or two. Um, but that could change with economic trends, it just depends. Um, if they're selling everything, then they're gonna build it all. Um, but if you're not selling it, then maybe you would hold off on build, putting up a structure because then you have to sell that structure with that investment. <clears throat> just by, by way of background, um, some of the research that staff completed uh, earlier in 2018 was a close look at some of the adjacent and neighboring jurisdictions and what they are doing. Um, with regard to their zoning controls. Now, it's really important when we talk about zoning controls to understand that you cannot cherry pick one zoning control and do an apples to apples comparison across jurisdictions. So this is because every jurisdiction has a unique combination of zoning controls that result in a desired outcome for that jurisdiction. So when we talk about um, setbacks or we talk about density, uh, we also need to understand that if you were to try and compare how density works in Bellevue as compared to how density has traditionally worked in Sammamish, they have some fundamental differences in those uh, assortment of zoning controls that they use for outcomes. So it's, it's important that when, when we're talking about this that we're not pulling out one thing and, and holding it up and saying, well, we really want to, you know, add, um, this control to Sammamish because I like this. It's, you need to look at, into that code that you're comparing it to and understand how that relates to the range of controls that that code uses. Um, so this is an example of one control that we did. We tried to do um, an apples to apples comparison across jurisdictions, 
So if you didn't know in the background what some of the other controls were, you would see that, oh, the, the city, the cities of um, Bellevue, Shoreline, Redmond, Kirkland, Bothell all have minimum lot sizes. Um, and that is something that drives the form of development because every lot that is created, generally speaking, in a subdivision is required to be of a certain minimum size. The city of Sammamish doesn't have that. So we might see um, developments that are more clustered in, in one area that do not require a plan unit development or some other type of review, whereas other jurisdictions have a, a, a standard of minimum lot size. Um, so that's one thing we considered. Another thing that we talked about internally when we were doing our background research was whether or not the zoning controls that the city, the array of zoning controls that the city has in place currently could be adjusted to achieve the same outcome as if we were to add another zoning control to the mix. So in the case of a minimum lot size, <clears throat> if you were considering adding a minimum lot size, one alternative might be to adjust your setbacks accordingly based on the pattern or the trend of, of footprints that we see, and that would ultimately result in achieving a target lot size. So in the, in the case where um, you have a, you wanna say a 2,400 square foot footprint, a 40 by 60 rectangle, if you were to increase the setbacks around that rectangle, you would accordingly see an increase in the size of the lot, and you might end up with a target size much like what some of these other jurisdictions have in terms of their lot sizes. Um, but again, the complexity lies in the details. It's very hard to compare these rules unless you're collectively looking at the array of rules used by the jurisdiction. Um, so with regard to the focus group, um, when we began the process of um, mapping out the legislative review for this, um, we really wanted to understand what some of the issues were, um, and we wanted to make sure that we were in a safe area where we could ask some questions and get real answers and listen to conversation between some different perspectives. Um, so what we did was we put together a focus group um, that included uh, four members of the development community, um, and we were looking for um, large builders, medium-sized regional builders, um, so large national builders, medium-sized regional builders, local builders, and maybe some engineering input. We did find that. Um, we included uh, Mike Walsh from uh, Tureen Homes, who is the, who also happens to be the outgoing president of the Master Builders Association, so it was good to have his perspective from the Master Builders Organization, which is why we, we wanted to ask him if he'd participate. Um, we, we had included uh, Toll Brothers as a nationwide builder and what their perspective is, because they have um, a, a broader range of experience in their building across the country. Um, we included uh, McPherson Construction. Uh, Dan Boucher is an architect for McPherson Construction who is a local custom home builder in the city of Sammamish. Actually, their offices are here in Sammamish. Um, they build quite a few homes in the city. Um, we also included uh, Toby Conan, who is um, a Sammamish resident, I think 15 years Sammamish resident, but he's also a civil engineer with Pace Engineering, um, has been in the industry for quite some time. It's a it's a, a large engineering firm that does uh, site planning and engineering for development. Um, then we went to um, private citizens and we wanted to include the perspective of a, a wide diverse group of citizens. So we, we looked at um, backgrounds of people. Uh, we found people who had been here, an individual who had been here for I think over 30 years had raised his kids here. Um, and, and on the other end of the spectrum, we found an individual where she had moved here, um, I think three to six months ago, um, and had just bought a house here. So we were, and in between that, there were several other ranges of experience and, and professions of private citizens who live here in the city, own homes here in the city. Um, so it was a really good group. Um, and what we did was we walked the group through a presentation that we're gonna do now for you um, and ask some questions around sentiment towards certain issues, um, what they felt about that type of change, what they thought that the impact on development might be, 
uh, there was some great conversation between the different members of the forum. And actually after the forum ended, um, they, uh, the, some, some members stayed and kept talking. So it, it was a good conversation. Um, good to see that happening. Uh, so some of the things that we were looking for was... David, um, wait one minute. I Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to tell the commissioners in, the last, in case they didn't know that they took those folks from the boards and commission applicants. Uh, to me, I thought that was interesting because you didn't just kind of grab these guys out of thin air. They yeah, so what we did was we went to the pool of applicants for the boards and commissions um, and we reviewed some resumes and some background, some, some letters of interest. Um, and that really helped us understand where people were coming from and it enabled us to try to um, include people with a very wide range of interests and backgrounds. Um, and e everyone had had an experience with development that they were very uh, willing to share. Some, you know, many of them positive, many of them negative. So we were trying to sort through the issues that way and get a better understanding of what is really, what is really the, the, the root of some of these concerns that we commonly hear um, in an effort to understand where in our regulations that might be, wh wh where the origin of that might be. If development is coming through the city and our regulations aren't addressing certain things, well, what is it exactly that's missing? Um, and I think that's what we're, we're seeing, we're showing here on this slide is, you know, what, why we used a focus group and, and what, what did we hope to learn from the group? Um, the, the, so we asked in, in prep for the focus group, we did phone interviews. Um, and so I held nine hour long phone interviews um, and got to talk to these people in, in detail about the background, about what we were trying to achieve, about what their experiences were. Um, and um, these are some of the responses to a few of the questions. Um, and we'll walk through these. Um, the, this one question was, are you satisfied with how development is handled in the city of Sammamish? Um, so, you know, we, we had a, a wide, a wide range of responses, could be done better, not happy with it, um, would like to have consistent and predictable processes and outcomes. And there's been some inconsistencies in how the city has handled these things. Um, this building process can be difficult, understood. Um, there's definitely room for improvement. However, the current direction is positive. Um, there's still an emphasis on preserving certain attributes and preservation of nature has worked out okay. Um, not anymore. Um, I was, although neighbors have recently been given more authority over issues, the process has changed in that those opposing projects are given more credence when the rules haven't changed. Um, there is room for improvement. Uh, we need collaboration from the council and need to eliminate their disconnect from staff. Council needs to be the long-term stewards of regulations and laws and recognize the established community vision. Um, the next one is, um, do you feel the city of Sammamish has historically had adequate development regulations? Uh, this was a, there was a mixed response here, although interestingly most indicated yes. Um, some couldn't answer because they hadn't lived here long enough or been, ex been exposed to development in the city for a long enough period of time, although very few said no. The other question that we asked was, do you have any examples of communities where you feel development is better handled than Sammamish? Why and what is what specifically is different? Um, one individual cited Toll Brothers homes being built in Flower Mound, Texas are far better built than Sammamish. And when I was having this conversation with this individual, it was something along the lines of, it feels like an assembly line here in the city and they're getting these, these homes are being built as quickly as possible. Whereas this project was something that was seemed a little more meditated and slow. Um, and therefore they felt the quality of the homes being built was, was higher than here in part due to the, the, the feverish pace of development was I think the exact words. Um, and again, that, that plays into the next one, which is from a totally different person. They're concerned with the rate of development. So one of the interesting things that happened here in the city was that um, when the economy uh, declined um, in the last cycle, many of the projects that had been in review and had been approved um, because of the, the protections that they're given were mothballed. So they might have made it through the paper platting process, but not actually broken ground on a project or they broke ground but only made some minor clearing and they stopped as a result of the economy. When the economy came back, many of these projects had changed hands, potentially had gone through bankruptcy, potentially were owned by the same builder, 
and many of these came back to a roaring start. Um, at the same time, we had other projects that had just been put into the system that made it through the system fairly quickly and also began construction. So we were basically seeing two cycles of construction occurring at the same time, which leads to far more projects under construction in, and out there when we, we went from basically having nothing for a while because of the economy to having all of this activity. And I think that's what I got out of that conversation was a lot of the concern around development was related to the perception of the rate of development that was occurring out in the community. Um, and there, there was a, you know, several, uh, several individuals asked me, can't the city meter the number of permits that it gives? Because there's too many permits right now. There's too many roofers, there's too many sheet rockers, there's too much construction material, there's too much noise, there's too much change occurring in my neighborhood. Um, and so that was an interesting one to hear. So we, we parked that for further discussion in the future. Um, some examples were um, Bellevue, uh, Kirkland and Redmond, um, and that they had done a, jo a great job realizing their vision. So if they had a vision and they stuck with it was the, was the theme that I heard, was that the perception is, is that some of these other adjacent cities had recognized their vision and stuck with their vision, whether right or wrong, and that they were trying to achieve that vision. Um, Another individual indicated Amsterdam, um, that there was a great balance of commercial and residential and it's mixed together. And we talked a little bit about how difficult it might be to actually run a, a, a city and, de and manage development with that type of outcome. It's complex, so it was a good conversation. Um, the, um, the next one, which I think is a really important one, is what do you perceive to be the most important zoning controls in the city of Sammamish and why? And by far and away, it was setbacks. Um, the other one, which I liked, this was a good answer, was a mix that provides the best outcome and allows for coordinated and healthy growth and restricts density, density to that which is appropriate given the level of service offered. So this goes hand in hand with, um, you know, do we have adequate school capacity? Do we have um, adequate road capacity? Those discussions are largely outside or a field of this discussion that we're having but it helps paint a picture of sort of where some of the sentiment around development comes from and the feel, the angst that some people experience with a, with a very fast paced rate of development. Um, the last one was density. Um, many, many I talked to felt that density was a really big driver because you might have a vacant lot one day and then you might have many homes on it a year later. Um, so I tried to replicate um, those phone interviews with um, four members of the Planning Commission. Um, I was able to hold two phone interviews where I had two individuals um, on the line. Um, so we tried to make it through all of the, the questions, although it, because we had a much more robust conversation, I think you all are more advanced in your understanding of the development in the city than, than all of the members of that, that group were. Um, so, and it also was having two members on the phone was a little harder to get through all the questions than just having one individual to talk to. So we tried to make it through all the questions. We didn't quite make it through all the questions in each of the interviews. Um, but these are some of the responses with regard to, do you feel um, the city of Sammamish has historically had adequate development regulations? Uh, one answer was no, we have King County rules and haven't done something different. We should understand what we're trying to do. We have higher level things that we aren't comfortable with. This is sort of just the, the feeling of how things fit together here. So what I got out of it. Um, probably not, we should have had the interim regs in place when we incorporated. Um, in terms of current ongoings, the city is on track with trying to get our arms around the issues presented with development. Um, and we're trying to chart a course for future development. Um, so we're, we're doing okay trying to get our arms around these things. It's challenging um, as we've seen much of the discussion in the public forum with the city has been focused around development related issues lately. So I think this response was, was in line with that, that there, this individual was seeing a lot being done in the city in an attempt to get our arms around the issues and establish where we're going for future development. Um, the last one was no, but that comes from a perspective of a non-builder. Um, there's not enough enforcement. Um, it's difficult for non-builders to complete projects, so an individual wanting to build their own home. Um, developers have easier access to the city. 
Um, the next one um, is really just some other comments that I heard um, as we didn't make it through all of the uniform questions as, as easily as the individual interviews. So these are some of the things I heard from the discussions with the Planning Commission members. Um, the city could do better at public outreach with new projects. This could come in the form of engaging citizens on, on in forums like, um, like some, there may be some sort of way to have a blog or th something we could engage the citizens with, a better map of development, those types of things. Um, we need to work on the perception that community development cares more about the developer than neighbors. Um, it felt like a gold rush. Uh, little is cared about the end result, get as much value out of the ground as possible. And that's in line with some of the responses I got from the individuals as part of the forum, the uh, focus group. Um, we have a delicate transportation system. This affects people's lives. We haven't thought about it when approving development. So it's the question around adequate capacity and the rate of approval of development and the rate of deployment of infrastructure in the city. Um, has to do with schools and transportation. Um, there's no blending in character. Um, every project stands out. It's sort of, there's no consistency. Um, and it doesn't seem, the, the, what I got out of this is that it just seems haphazard how these projects are designed and that it, there's homes being pushed into every nook and cranny possible. And in some cases with a detrimental outcome on character. Um, Views of public pl places such as the lake are being impacted by new development, and this is where we might have large homes being built along our shoreline. Um, maybe not a subdivision issue, but maybe more in line with um, a change in character from a smaller cabin type atmosphere along the parkway to a larger waterfront home atmosphere. Um, tree preservation decisions don't make sense, and this is where you might see a stand of spindly trees being preserved that are not wind firm and that are then susceptible to being blown over or that are going to be asked for removal as a hazard tree or an unhealthy tree at a later date. Um, the policies and the vision and the comp plan aren't being met um, in terms of the projects that we're seeing being built on the ground. That was one that I heard a few times. Um, so with those, um, uh, another, question that I asked the commission, and this is consistent with the other question I asked the, the panel, was what do you perceive to be the most important zoning controls in the city of Sammamish and why? Um, one of the ones that came up, which was consistent with the panel, was density. Um, and the response there was we needed it in an appropriate location. Density affects the other controls. And it needs to be context sensitive. Um, zoning and setbacks was one that came up. I think this was related to um, do we have the appropriate setbacks by zone? Um, do we have the, the right mix of zoning in the city? So some of these are really big issues that are not necessarily the focus of this discussion. So it's a, this is a good learning exercise for us because we're understanding more and more about some of the community issues and can help us inform future work plans. Um, one was infrastructure. Um, and again, that's consistent with a lot of the discussions here at the city with regard to transportation infrastructure. Um, Open space, um, we all use the space and need it for quality of life. And this is an interesting one because there are multiple ways to achieve it. And I think we'll be talking about that a little bit more here. Um, you know, wh whether or not you require as a matter of division tracks of open space or whether you require larger parcels with the division, that's the balance, right? You can't require a larger parcel and require the open space because the, the efficiency in land use is really impacted there and the cost of new homes then goes up accordingly. So the question is, do you want the open space in a tract that's uh, maybe a public private tract where the neighborhood HOA owns it and manages it? Or would you rather have the open space accounted for in a larger lot size with a restriction around the size of the house that can go on it that requires then more of a pattern or grid type of open space? It's, it's a good question, I think, in terms of um, patterns and what you're looking for. Um, the last one was grading, that it can impact um, the city's character in a great way. So depending on how grading of a site is handled can result in a pretty significant impact on, on the community character. Um, so with that, I, if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. If not, we'll move into the individual um, discipline related um, questions uh, where we'll try to um, have a discussion around how you how you want us to proceed with some of these items.
All right, so um, the first one is, um, with the interim development regulations, setback designations were changed to include, as I described previously, uh, designation of a side and rear setback, and the setbacks were increased to provide greater separation between homes. Um, so this is a, a slide that we've used previously, um, and it, it, what it does is it conveys a different approach to setbacks, and if we increase the setbacks, we might end up with a result something like where the green arrows are, as opposed to the, the specifically the 2013 setbacks and also the 2016 setbacks, to some degree, the red arrows that we're seeing here. Um, the, the boxes that are drawn below in the graphics um, show how you might end up with a, a 4,500 square foot lot with a 40 by 60 home versus um, a, a 6,000 square foot lot with a 40 by 60 home. So you can see, as I described previously, one way to achieve a larger lot size in the city is to increase setbacks. Um, but in those districts where we require open space, it's also important to understand that that that's putting that's creating a lot, a lot more open space. So if you were to give up some open space in terms of the standard that requires open space, in lieu of requiring a bigger setback, that might be a balance that could be struck. Um, it's, it's also the question is, what is the right size setback here in the city? That's the dial. Where do we want to turn that? So the question for you, the, the commission is, how do you feel about this change? And what do you think the impacts are on development that this has? I just think when I think about setbacks, I'm not sure, David, if I'm going to answer your question or not, but when I think of setbacks and as I drive and walk around the city, um, because I'm not buying a new house, so I'm just looking at the new construction and I'm looking at from um, a citizen's point of view when I'm walking down the street and how does this new development look to me? How does it look from the road that I'm driving by? Uh, what am I seeing as this new development is going up? Am I going to be seeing the TV screen in the living room as I'm driving by um, because I can see clearly into their living room? Um, and so that's when I, that's how I think about setbacks. I think about how close is their garden going to be to the sidewalk? How close is their living room going to be to the road? And how that impacts our neighborhood character? And I see we have m many new construction that, that I could name that kind of fall into that. Um, and so when I think of setbacks, I think about how does the new development impact the city overall as we're all driving by in our cars and we're seeing that. So I know that we think about setbacks from the inside of the development, from the street, and, and you're in relation to your neighbors and who's living in, the, in that particular neighborhood. But from the point of view of, of the rest of the citizens, when this neighborhood goes in, how does this impact the character of the overall city? So when we're driving down 228, how's that, how's that development change the look of 228? When we're driving down the Issaquah <coughs> Pine Lake Road, how does the Connor Jarvis development impact the, uh, the neighborhood character of Sammamish? Um, because I, I continually seeing that there is less space between the sidewalk and the fence to the backyard than there are in older neighborhoods where we have lots of trees and we have lots of like mature trees between the road and the fence to the backyard. And then there's a house way in the back and I don't even know that there's a house in there. So that's what I think of when I think of setbacks. Um, and I'm not sure, I, can, I, I like the bigger setback. I think the, the more, <laughs> from, from my point of view, the, the more distance there is between us and the new development, I think that's a positive direction. I'm just not sure if this particular one gets me any closer to what I'm talking about, <laughs> where I want like a forest between me and the road and the new development. But um, so that's what I think of when I think about setbacks. A comment and a question. Um, my comment is that I think that, at least for me, the challenge is it feels like we're, the, you kind of present this this image anyway presents a choice between larger setbacks or more density and what i don't what i would not want to see is you know 
not getting the setbacks and also not getting open space. In other words, if the trade-off, and we think about how to do it properly, is that we'll accept smaller setbacks in return for some common open space or something that makes sense, then that may be more, what's on the left could be more tolerable. But the problem is I think the perception is, and I certainly have it, is that what we get is what's on the left and nothing that contributes to the community either. So, it, you know, I understand that the, with the image on the right, that's very similar to my neighborhood, um, but my neighborhood doesn't have any public, you know, any neighborhood set aside or anything like that. I think that should be at least considered. Um, my question is, so when I look at the, the close, um, the minor side yard setbacks in particular, I think about some of the old, almost historic neighborhoods in places like Everett and Seattle and old neighborhoods, they had smaller homes with um, kind of a cottage style almost. And what we're seeing, so, so to me, a, a closer density with, you know, in other words, smaller side yard setbacks with a smaller home makes good sense. But when we see 5,000 square foot homes that are eight feet apart, that doesn't make any sense at all. So I also wonder if that dial could be adjustable so that you could say the size of the house that you're building may have an influence over the yard setbacks that are allowed. Because if you're gonna build smaller homes, then maybe you can build them closer together because the scale makes sense. But if you're gonna build larger homes, you have to increase those numbers. So I, the approach I agree with, but it can be too bluntly applied and it may not always work, work the way we want it to. It may just result in us getting nothing but McMansions that have the setbacks and we get no community open space, which might feel good at times, but we're missing out on some other opportunities. I don't think it's either or. I uh, I like what Mark is saying. Uh, I I think our problem is that we're looking at it like we either get to have open space somewhere, public open space or HOA open space or setbacks. And with our housing strategy, we came up with other options. We came up with uh, other options that fit our comp plan. We wanted to see more small apartment buildings, things like that. Zoning would help that. Zoning could even help us create open space by preserving some of our existing older housing, which we, is also one of the goals we had. If we could preserve some of that existing older housing on uh, one dwelling unit per acre, we would have open space, it would be private open space, but it would fulfill that need for open space. So there's so many more options if we can delineate our zoning in such a way, make it much more detailed than this blanket zoning that we have, I think we could achieve what we all want to see. But we're not getting there by just saying it's either got to be public open space or setbacks. Um, so your question was, do we think that this is a good tool? And I, I guess short of modifying the tool and just saying this is the tool you get, either use it or don't, I say that it's a good thing. Um, I do like Mark's suggestion about having, and, and I think m many of us think that a more dynamic or a dial that has infinite dialing versus clicks in it type of thing uh, would, be, would be great. Um, I wonder about the home size versus setbacks and kind of over time, you know, having additions and remodels and things like that, how that would kind of tie in, but it's still a, an interesting idea to, you know, it's all about, I think, maintaining some view of the sky uh, around, which is important for our climate and in our environment. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what I have. Um, oh, go over to you first. Yeah, no, you go. Okay. Um, so I think when I you know, I first saw these, I thought, oh yes, this is excellent, and I have since spent more time thinking about what it really means. And I think um, my comment 
to David when we were having the interview was the one about the open space because that's what I really am concerned about. Um, I'm less concerned with people having big, large, private backyards because I rarely see them used and more concerned with having you know a, a community space where we can all share and meet each other and play with our kids in the park. Um, that's what I enjoy. I don't have a huge backyard, but I enjoy walking my kids down the street so that we can go use the park and see all of our friends and neighbors, which is how I've met almost all of my neighbors. Um, so that to me is really important. And I'm also very concerned with the efficient use of land and considering the state of housing affordability, I think it's something we really have to keep in mind because requiring setbacks of this size would, of course, reduce the affordability, which everyone's so concerned about. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh, this is my, this is actually the biggest thing. So what I'm, so open space, very important. What, what I think is important about setbacks is setbacks near arterial, uh, major and minor arterial streets. That's what I think is really the most important thing because we had this discussion a while back about you know buffers between the developments and the, the major and minor arterials and we had put forth a recommendation to require the buffers on major arterial streets and I think we maybe need to get back to that because I think what most people are upset about is these developments that pop up you know right five feet from the arterial street and, and that's concerning for a number of reasons, not just because their backyard is on the street. It's like if we ever need to widen the railroad or do anything, you know, it's basically impossible. So um, to me, I'd like to have something where we can consider the open space. I, I think these setbacks are, are excessive. Um, I, I do like setbacks. I do think we need a rear setback greater than five feet. I think five feet is too small, but I think maybe 20 feet is too much. Um, and I'd like to, again, look at the arterial street setbacks. So those are my, my thoughts. Thanks. Um, so I have a question. Um, you know, the house that I live in right now, it, it's, it's sort of a dream house in, in Klahani where we live. And that's probably, as an adult, the first house that, you know, my husband and I owned. And uh, we probably have everything that we want in that house, uh, our setback. You know, our backyard actually does not have a lawn because it's on a little slope. Um, and we're fine with that because we don't have to mow the lawn in, at the back. Um, but I wanted to go back a little bit and understand, you know, what are the purposes of the setbacks? Like Shanna said, you know, Let's have more buffers on the arterial so that we don't see, you know, uh, the homes right away. Or, you know, like uh, Roshin mentioned, you know, we don't want to see people's uh, TVs. So what is the historic purpose of a setback? And then secondly, I know you have, you, you know, these numbers that you've come up, they're not out of thin air. You've put in a lot of research into that. So can you walk us a little bit through that research that you did and why did you end up with these numbers? Yeah, so um, historically, setbacks have been included in development for many reasons. One is to, to push a certain pattern of outcome. Um, one is um, separation. A lot of it was you know, historically building codes where you had a fire separation, otherwise you needed to treat your wall with a certain type of material so that it could withstand burning until the fire department showed up to help put it out, right? So. Um, there's there's multiple reasons behind why setbacks over time have been integrated into development regulations, um, and what what one other reason why setbacks are currently important um, is that with a development site um, and ask you know ask any of the, the developers in the room um, with a with a development site it's becoming more and more um, an issue that every square inch of the site is accounted for with some other city requirement or jurisdictional requirement, um, whether it's you know storm drains or sewer lines or water lines or or low impact development, um, vegetated flow paths and things like that, um, and additionally trees and tree protection. Um, so if if trees were not being preserved in open space tracks on properties, which we do see more and more of. We haven't seen as many projects under the new city tree rules. We're starting to see more make it out of permitting. And those projects are definitely including more open space by choice on the part of the builder because they're required to preserve trees. 
And instead of trying to preserve trees on each of the individual lots that they will then be building on, they would rather preserve trees in an area that's a set aside so they don't have to worry about keeping all of their sub subcontractors out of the tree protection zones and all those things that are really hard to manage. It's my perception of it at least. Um, so, so, but if, if you were not doing open space and you didn't have that voluntary set aside to, in where you could preserve trees, it would be really important to have bigger setbacks because then you could actually account for meaningful tree preservation, meaningful tree planting, um, where trees might grow over time in between the homes. Um, I know that many of the divisions um, in the North Seattle area were, were post-war homes were bulldozed. You look at old aerial photographs from the 40s and it's pretty astonishing to see what was there, um, what happened and what's there now. You go back to some of those neighborhoods now um, and they're fully grown out with, with you know really tall conifer trees. So. It's important also to think about the life cycle of these projects and it might look a certain way right when it comes out of the ground, but the thought behind that is, well, what is it gonna look like in 30 years, 40 years? Um, what happens over time? So are we accounting for adequate space for meaningful landscaping to actually establish over time? Should we be accounting for that? That's a great question. Um, one other point in the conversation that we've heard is that over time here at the city is that w it would be great to have a perimeter open space area, perimeter landscape area, whether that be five feet or 20 feet, um, that for a larger project of a certain number of lots, like maybe the Connor Jarvis project would have qualified for, that you um, that you are required to put around the entire project a an open space area, which could have a trail in it. It, require, it would be a great place to either preserve trees or plant trees. Um, and then it would allow you interior to the division to have smaller setbacks because those people are buying homes that are already built that are like that and they're making a choice to live there as opposed to somebody making the choice for them to build it right behind their house. Um, so that's been something that we've talked about here um, over the years that I've been here. Um, with regard to your question um, regarding uh, the numbers and what we came up with. So if, if you remember the slide that I showed you regarding the minimum lot sizes, um, one of the things that we had considered was, should we add a minimum lot size to the array of zoning controls that are included in those tables? Um, it seems like most cities have it, a lot size. Um, it's fairly inconsistent how each city uses it, um, which is one of the complexities. Um, but an example is is where my prior employer, where I spent many, many hours working on different type of projects, but some subdivisions and short subdivisions um, was the city of Bellevue. And in the city of Bellevue, not only do they have a density calculation, but they also have a minimum lot size. So you might achieve a certain number of units by running the density calculation, and you might think that that is your level of entitlement where you'll be able to build that many homes, but then you might find a stark difference when you try and lay out those lots and come to the realization that you can't meet the minimum lot size requirements and you're gonna lose two lots. So, you know, in, in that case, in, in that jurisdiction and how they handle their code, the density calculation is not a hard entitlement. <clears throat> it's a baseline by which they can gauge, you know, you should get about this many lots. Um, then you are set, set about applying the other zoning controls and often projects lose lots. It's the most restrictive that controls. So it's a different, different way of doing business. So what we did here was we looked at if, if we were trying to account for a certain percentage of the property, the raw site um, being taken up in roads because roads come out of our density calculation as well. Um, so if you think about an acre being 43,560 square feet, and if you were thinking in the R4 zone, which we mostly have in the city, um, what would be a reasonable lot size here in the city, given the requirement that um, you, you have to give up um, from your density calculation roads that are required to be built for the project? <coughs> well, we came up with um, what you're looking at here, <coughs> which is, if you were to apply these setbacks, that would land you roughly in the 6,000 square foot lot size. What's important to also note is that there's a delta or a cross where the um, 
the lot coverage restrictions that apply to properties, whether through the um, the the what is it called the 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 landscape area. I have to go back to that slide, but um, there's there are other controls that that start to that start to be more burdensome than setbacks. So. If you look at uh, several designs, so we took a subdivision and we, several of these actually, and we redrew it um, based on a different scenario with a, with a market-sized footprint. So we were basing it on the market-sized footprint that we've been seeing, and we then reverse engineered the division to include um, different setbacks, and we wanted to see how many lots we could get out of it based on the dimensional standards that we were looking at. Um, and we found that in most instances, we could get almost the same number of lots um, if, if there were some other um, changes made. And part of that is, is that there's a crossroads between lot coverage and setbacks. At one point, the lot coverage controls. Um, so we, we looked at sort of what is that, that sweet spot, if you will, and that is where we came up with um, some of these, these setback dimensions. Um, now, again, it's a dial. You could turn it back one way or another. Um, it's just one of the zoning controls that we have in our code. Um, and maybe there are other ways to better achieve some of the outcomes that we're interested in for certain size projects, such as a perimeter landscape area, such as a larger arterial street setback, those types of things. So with that, I, I leave it up to you to discuss. <laughs> I was wondering if we could all agree that to have a dedicated rear setback. Does everybody like that part of it? I gotta punch the right button. Uh, a dedicated what? Rear setback. Because dedicated to what? Well, just since the code, not the interim de development, not the emergency code, but the code before the emergency didn't have a dedicated rear setback. And I was wondering if we could sort of start there and talk about do we do we think as a commission that having that dedicated rear setback is important? You know, rather than having on what is it the slide from 2013 where you see the five seven fifteen? No, that's 2016. Interior, yeah, interior setback, yeah. Right. So the new, you know, the newest iteration would. I, I was hoping that the newest iteration would have the dedicated rear setback, but I was wondering how everybody else felt about that. Yeah. In every zone. Shanna? Um, is it every zone, David? Every R zone. Every R zone? Okay. Can you go, can you go back to the, 2000, the, the interim, the emergency ordinance? This is the setback from the road. Is that what you mean by setback? Backyard. It would just always be the backyard. Rather than in, in some cases, it would be, yeah. in some cases, it would back up to a road, but not always. It would back up onto somebody else's backyard. Is that what you're saying? It's just like, I suppose the idea is that you would always have a backyard greater than, we'll start with five feet, but I don't think that's what, I, I would say okay. we wanna have at least 10 to 15 feet. But I just thought that would be but a nice place to from start. separating it out from not having a blended yes. setback is what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean. I think that just sort of gives staff like a good starting place. That's, yeah, I, that's the, my experience in most jurisdictions have a specific backyard setback, and oftentimes it's 20 feet. Sometimes it's 20 percent, and it has a function to do with if there's a certain minimum depth. If it's at least 100 feet, then it's 20 feet. If it's 95, then it's 20 percent, and there's some other things like that that they do to kind of realize that there's some, when you hit the ground, you know, there's some differences, but I do like the specific backyard. I think so it's I. important to have room for a trampoline or something like that in, yeah. in case the person wants it. <laughs> and trees. I mean, I, I think it's so important that we have the, uh, we have space to plant a decent conifer and that it could grow. Can I ask, when it says, uh, when we say a 20 foot minimum back setback, does, so if there's a, that, th these are all nice pictures with square lots. If we have a lot that's not like that, that has a, an angle in the back, is 20 foot minimum the minimum point or the average of that backyard? So how, how's that calculation done at a real high level? Yeah, so you're only required to have one rear yard, um, and that's the yard that is most obviously opposite the front yard or the street, right? So we have some pretty strangely shaped lots on occasion where we're confronted with the question of 
is that a rear yard or is that a side yard? Um, and most often we're able to figure it out because it's the one that is dominantly opposite. Yeah, that's not my question. My question is if one side of your backyard from the face of the building to the back is 10 feet and one side is 30 feet, 10 feet doesn't meet the minimum 20 foot, but the average still does. How's the calculation done? It would be 20 feet just parallel. It's an offset of the line. Hmm. So if it's on a curve, it's an offset to the curve. If it's a straight line, it's an offset to the straight line. So it's 20, 20 feet at any one point along that line of offset. So it's 20 foot minimum. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I think Shanna's point of uh, people needing trees in their yard, and especially when you're looking out the back and you have another house over there that has the same condition, you want some pretty big trees to screen that. And if you think about 20 feet is so small when you, next to these giant houses, it's just nothing. I, I think it would have to be at least 20 feet. That's pretty good. How do we feel about 20 feet from the street? Like if you were, if your if your rear yard backs up to an arterial, minor or minor or major. I just don't even know what 20 feet from the street means. I need a visual for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but it's probably not. <laughs> it's the length of your car, per. Oh, then uh, that's nothing. <laughs> it's a parking space. Yeah. That's one of the reasons 20 feet was used. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's not far. No. It's, I mean, even when you're talking about a setback from the street, I mean, so I know it's unrealistic to be expecting, you know, the amount of space that I want. <laughs> but so in a perfect world, right, so I could tell everybody what to do, but... That's not the case. So in lieu of that, to at least, I, I would love to see something where we say, okay, when we're looking at a development from a main arterial, principal arterial, or even a minor arterial, that from the sidewalk to where the backyard fence is going to be, even if they're, even if we can't dictate a width, that there's going to be something put there in place where there's gonna be some screening between the road and the development. Like I look at 228 and I see we have those cottages that have gone in mm -hmm. and they're built right up to the fence. Yeah. Um, and I feel for both the pedestrian and the motor and the person who's bought that house right. um, because we're right beside each other. And of course that brings in the whole notion of neighborhood character because that to me is a very urban way of living. Mm -hmm. You know, if I live in downtown Seattle, you know, and I've lived in, in inner cities myself <laughs> where you're sitting in your living room and you see people walking by, you know, because your living room window is parallel with the sidewalk. And that's urban living. But this is not urban living. And that's another conversation, like what kind of living is this in Sammamish? Who are we? What are we? Are we urban? Are we suburban? Are we rural, right? So when I look at 228 and I see there's umpteen different examples of we're not quite sure who we are, um, because I see wooden fences on 228, and then there's a house right there, or a living dwelling unit of some kind just right over the fence. And then I'm on other streets, on minor arterials, where they have a forest between the road and the development. And I think, so what, that's, when I, that's what I'm talking about when I think about setbacks, that we haven't gotten to grips with what that really means for the city. Um, in different corridors in our city. So what do we want 228 to look like? Right. And it's, it's kind of time we made up our mind because we're running out of time if we haven't already run out of time because this is our main thoroughfare. And um, so that's, what, that, that's my main concern about setbacks is what does it do to the overall look of the city? Well, then maybe we should talk about the perimeter idea. And I'm guessing that would be mostly for long plats. Right, because you really couldn't require something like that in a short plot. Um, Klahani has this concept, right? The perimeter all around Klahani is, how, how do you know, do you have any idea what the width is? No. I, would you say 50 feet? No, it's significant. I mean, it's significant. It's 
You think 100 feet? So the the difference with that would be is that that's a master plan community, right, that's a whole and one. the size, the sheer size of that could account for it. I don't believe we have enough land, any any land left in the city that would account for something of that size. But that's the idea, right? Just on a smaller scale. Yes. And are we in favor of this type of? So do we have to idea. make a decision today, or are I we just giving so. just direction, yeah, just saying that thought. we like setbacks? Yeah, I, I think, think it just it gives be... staff the idea if it, is this something they should pursue or not. Okay, so this is like that one of those parameters mm -hmm. of uh, the zoning control, right? Like, can setback be one of the zoning controls? That's what we were talking about. Yeah, should should this be something should that we be? continue to research and bring back to uh, you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 We don't have to decide the number. We're just. I guess I, I'd only point out that. I know we can't have it all. That buffers are a great idea, but there are going to be trade-offs because. Yeah, of course. That's the open space. Right. Possibly. You got you got to find a way to to not have to choose one or the other, but provide options that create character and diversity, and provide some open space. You know, they, we need to try to do many of these things. So I think it's just we should be careful not to say, you know, buffers. That's not really the choice. Yes or no. It's. Right. How does it fit into an overall strategy right. that will work to create um, diversity of housing and neighborhoods that match the character, provide opportunities for trails and growth, tree growth, and those sorts of things? So that's why I'm hesitant to just say, right. do we want to do these setbacks, yes or no? Well, I don't. It's not to me a yes or no. Do we want to do buffers? It's not a yes or no. All of these are good ideas. I don't think any of them should be thrown out, but that application of them needs to be thoughtful. Angry. So if I could add one additional filter for your consideration, and that is that one of the objectives of this exercise has been to keep the rules, to keep it simple and something that we can administer. Um, one, of the, the, one of the comments that we regularly hear from, whether it's an individual citizen trying to build something, an architect or a, develop, a larger developer is, is that when you, had com when you add complexity, you add areas of ambiguity, you add um, confusion and you add uh, opportunities for miscommunications and problems to arise. So when we look at these, we wanna think about, and one of the reasons why we, we were able to so strategically put forward some code changes with the interim regs was because we were thinking really focused on what, is, what are those areas of the code that could be adjusted that actually add a lot of value towards achieving the outcomes that we're desiring without adding all sorts of different things to the code for the purpose of, and, and I understand what, what you're talking about, um, the things we're discussing here. There's some big issues, some big concepts, but there's also things that we can do within the range of controls that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and we're also here to listen to what you have to say in order to help bring us, us bring back things that you could actually make a decision on the next time. If I can, I'd just like to respond to your comment there a little bit. I think it's um, it seems like a great idea to say things like keeping it simple is the right thing to do, it makes it easy. I agree with that concept, but I don't think we should be convinced, we shouldn't convince ourselves that simple, which can become a very blunt tool, is always the best thing if we need to add some layers of complexity to get the outcome we want, then certainly we should do that. The, the, the trap of being drawn intuitively to simplicity can create undesirable outcomes because it becomes so blunt that you can't, you, you don't have options, like you said, the dials and the switches. Because you, I mean, just like the, like I said, if you have a backyard, you have a square face house and you have a backyard that's at an angle because there's a, a open space or whatever it is, and that backyard is starts at 30 feet and then the last five feet are under 20 feet, all of a sudden that doesn't comply. That to me seems like we've applied something that's very blunt that didn't really achieve the outcome we wanted. So I'd only just challenge that. I, I, I love the idea of things being simple. That seems intuitively great, but we should be careful not to create something that's simple and doesn't really provide the outcome we want. And I, I think that's probably what's happened with our existing uh, zoning is that it has been too simple and it hasn't uh, responded to the, uh, we're getting the character that we're getting overall that just 
this uh, same kind of housing clear across acres and acres and miles of land. And I think that's been the, the problem. We, we need to zero in and, and do more uh, detailed work. Right, you were gonna get hom homogeneity. I mean, with simple rules, you get simple outcome and you get homogeneity. It's, homogeneity is good for being predictable and knowing how much money you're gonna make off a certain investment, but it leaves us with the types of things that we have, which I think the community is unhappy with. So it may actually require some complexity to, to get some complex outcomes. Perhaps. So there's, there's definitely though a break line in the review process and what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis where the more discretionary points of decision-making in the code that were put in front of us, the more diff complex it is to get through a process. So I would, I would suggest that there's a, a break point where you can process something through the standard processes that we have today with certain a number of points of discretionary decision making. There's also another process that's out there that other jurisdictions have used, and I'm not an advocate of this necessarily, but it's called a plan unit development and it's design review. Those are the kinds of things that add a lot more staff, expense, those types of things. But a lot of the stuff that I'm hearing here, many of the items that I'm hearing are, are tools that are applied in other cities through design review where there is, the whole point of it is, is the whole thing is one big discretionary discussion. Um, and that's a very different format for de design review. What we're talking about here are the processes that we already have in place, which does not include design review. And those are where we, we're really, when we're confronted with everything becoming a discretionary decision, um, it's really difficult because Everyone's unhappy, whether it's a citizen who wants to appeal because we didn't do it right, whether it's a developer who wants to appeal because we didn't do it right. Basically, it turns the staff into the whipping post of the community, and we're taken to the woodshed regularly because we didn't do it right. So what we're looking for out of, out of this is to retain some clarity and to try and not add a bunch of discretionary decision-making points where we will invariably be told we did it wrong. So, David, would you consider this almost as a baseline to start off with, and then there can be additional layers of... Yes, uh, and there are several other of these that we could walk through. So this was this right. was a good example. This, I think, is one of the more complex ones. Um, so that's why I threw it in there first. I think the rest of these you'll find are easier to discuss. Um, now that you've um, understood sort of the point of the exercise, having a conversation about it, um, and trying to understand or trying to give us give us some feedback so we can come back to you with some decision points on what you might want to include and not include. This is this is more of an exercise around us gathering intel from you about how you feel about things. David, I have one more thing to add, and that would be that the way I feel about the perimeter situation is if you if you did have a perimeter situation and the houses that backed up to that perimeter, they wouldn't require such a large setback because they would have that perimeter. So. I know that's a layer of complexity, but if you're starting with something like this, then those are the kinds of things that I would want to add to make it more dynamic. Yes, and, and that is also a, a binary requirement. You either have it or you don't, okay. that kind of thing. So that's okay. not discretionary for the city, okay. which is something that helps us, you know, we can just check it and see that they did it. And that, that makes our review, um, I don't want to say easier, but more predictable. Yeah. <laughs> You either have it or you don't. So that's kind of what we're talking about. There's the right blend of, of those discretionary decision points versus those, those sort of binary checkpoints where you either have it or you don't. Um, and that's that right combination that we're looking for to get the outcome that we're, we're hoping to achieve. Um, so with the next one, uh, this one's building height and facade. And this is where we changed how building height is measured. We changed it to be measured from average uh, existing grade instead of average finished grade. Um, this was in relationship to the problem where we'd seen um, some parts of the city <coughs> where uh, sites were built up and then homes were built on top of those built up sites. So you might have been able to put in five or 10 or 15 feet of fill on a site um, and 
maybe not 15, but you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm exaggerating that. And then you'd build a house on top of it. Um, and you would, you then would be measuring from that finished grade to the peak of the roof. So you could have a 35 foot tall house on top of eight feet of fill and end up with 43 foot tall house as compared to what the grade was prior. Um, the other one is with regard to facades. I think this picture tells the story, although I believe this is a West Seattle picture. Um, it's it's uh, an issue where you have an older generation of homes that might be single story and you have new homes coming in and being built next to them with large um, walls, maybe on a slope so that the average measurement to that home allows you to build a more than a 40 foot tall wall with no architectural modulation. So that requirement was is that if you're going to build up, you know, to a certain height with a wall next to an existing home, that you should add some architectural modulation. And we've added some criteria for that. The builders in the group that I, that I heard, the message I heard was is they didn't see this as a problem. They had some concern with the way homes are measured being measured from average um, existing, or excuse me, average existing grade. And mostly that was related to the amount of data collection and planning that has to go into a project in advance. You have to really understand and map out your existing topography and you know what, who's reviewing it at the city, how does that work? There's concern around, around predictability in the city and our ability to review that. That's what I heard from the development community, so. Just to clarify, when you said they didn't have a problem with this, you meant the revised regulation, not that picture right there, right? Uh, the, yeah, the revised regulation, correct, where we measure building height from average um, existing grade. So how does basements work into the, these? Um, it's, it, they, they would not count. They would not count? Yeah, so if, if you were excavating out a basement um, from the existing grade, um, it would be the point of measurements taken from where the ground touches the foundation. Because I think I'm seeing a resurgence of houses with basements these days in Sammamish. So that's why I was a little, um, and seeing some taller homes than average. Okay. Uh, average grade is, I've, a lot of jurisdictions use average grade for ways of determining maximum building height. There's also some bonuses for heights if you have sloped roof versus a flat roof and some other things like that too. So there might be some additional things that we can do to enhance this. The picture <coughs> with the tall building next to the other one, I'm, there's examples here in, in the city of stuff that look similar to that. And so I think we do need to be careful about that. And yet I still think it could be controlled uh, with distance to existing structures mm -hmm. and vegetation. So I'm not as, I'm not as, I, I want detail. I don't want blank space. A lot of uh, crazy open space that we can't afford. I just want it detailed and controlled so that we know where it is and where it can happen and how much of it we're going to have so we can plan. I, I think that that's important. The next one. Um, is masquerading, and this is one where, with the interim development regulations, um, we changed the clearing and grading code to limit uh, mass grading of sites. Um, this is a big one to the development community. We've heard quite a bit from them about um, how this impacts their ability to design and clear and the progression of the different stages of development. Um, also, when you're confronted with uh, uneven topography or um, certain infrastructure requirements for things like drainage um, that require gravity, the inability to grade out a property to then connect all of the homes um, to pipes that 
require gravity is an impact to development as well. So we did hear from the development community on that. We did also hear from the members of the community that were at the, at the um, focus group that um, that it's startling when, when you live next to a forested or a vegetated area and you come home one day from work and all the trees are knocked down and being, being ground up. And that, that was part of it, but it was also then that, that the, the grade that you had become accustomed to next to you is now severely modified over time and benched out. And there's a lot of construction activity that goes along with that. So the question is, you know, whether or not, um, we should include restrictions in the permanent regulations on mass grading, um, given that, you know, there, there are impacts to development or whether we think that, that we could find a middle ground, um, which we're, include some restrictions or whether we should remove this completely. David, I was wondering if you could go into more detail of, of what the limits on the, the full grading was, like what, where are we now? What can you do to a site at this point in the emergency ordinance? Um, so there's limits on the amount of excavation and fill that can be placed on a property. Is it like um, volume of dirt? I mean, how do they uh, calculate heights, heights? Heights, so the amount of the depth okay. of fill. Okay. Um, we have we don't have a cubic yardage limitation. Um, the the code does talk about um, the limitation on mass grading, so going out and clearing a site, if you will, um, to a degree which then you are are digging down in certain areas. What what I think the the code is trying to achieve is to limit the complete removal of topsoil on a site, um, and then the, the benching like you see here of a property, um, and then the placement of um, homes on top of flattened sites. The question that, that, that we've asked is to the development community, and, they, and they've responded that, that you know this is something that is really complex for them, is, is whether or not the development community can build out a site in a manner that that allows for them to do partial clearing and grading for roads and in utilities, but retains some of the existing topsoils and vegetation, and that then homes are more designed to be custom on a site-by-site -site basis. What that does is it changes the entire uh, <laughs> practice of building from being, and I don't mean this negatively, and there's no way to say it without it coming across negatively, of an assembly line type process where you go in and you strip everything out, you bench it, you put in all your required infrastructure, and then you come back and you build homes. One of the things I understand to be appealing to this type of action is that um, in addition to the engineering, the ease of engineering, because you basically manipulate the topography to the lowest point that you're trying to connect a sewer or a storm pipe to, you can fall, chase it back and then just grade it out to that and use walls to account for differential grades. Um, but is that they're then able to use um, any one of maybe five home designs in the project and every site is the same. So it makes it easy to build on um, in an assembly line type manner because you put foundation one over there, foundation two over there, and then you build home one over there, home two over there, and, and you can also sell lots. Um, so if, if you're, a, if you're a, 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 in the market for a home, you go to visit one of these sites, they might have 30 lots available, you choose lot 25, and then they might have five homes available that you could choose from to put on that lot. You choose home three. Um, and then there's your package right there. And what it does is it appeals to a far broader base of buyer. Um, it's kind of like going to, the, to buy a car. You walk in, they've got five models you can choose from. You walk out with your car. As opposed to saying, oh, you only have one. I don't like that one. So I had a couple comments. Um, <clears throat> One is I think that that some respect for the existing topography is part of the character of Sammamish. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that this, and of course this picture is a fairly stark example. There's lots of other ones that wouldn't be so stark that I'm not sure how this would necessarily apply. And I frankly live in a neighborhood where they maintain much of the grade but put in some rockeries and my driveway is steep and uncomfortable. But the character of the community on that hillside is a huge part of um, what the neighborhood feels like and, and the desirability. 
So I'm, I'm hesitant to say that, you know, we should ever allow this to happen. On the other hand, I'm a little torn because one of the things that was apparent to me when, I, when I've been out and looked at the 42nd Street barricade, is that right? Mm -hmm. the, the problem that exists there was created because grading was not addressed properly as two neighborhoods were built and came together. So you end up with a grade issue where it becomes a huge safety problem for the roadways that they built. And that's what resulted in that barricade being there and it being a very difficult problem to solve. So it's, it's hard for me to say that we should overly restrict the ability to create safe um, and functional infrastructure in a neighborhood, but there has to be some degree of respect for the topography that exists. I don't know how you figure what that balance is. It's not this picture, but there are other situations where maybe it's appropriate to do to create the outcome that you want. And I, all I'm raising is problems, not solutions, but that certainly causes me to be a little torn on, on this one. So with the adjustment that was made to the interim regulations on November 6th, one of the things that we did was we held a, um, a, a meeting with the, two different meetings with members of the development community and we invited them in in October, I think it was October. Um, and we, we talked about the rules, tried to understand from them what they saw as difficult points of the, the regulations, the interim regulations. And we then proposed some adjustments to the city council as part of the November 6 package. One of the adjustments that was made was um, an exception to the grading restriction for roads when you need to make a certain grade work in a road to be safe or to get a road in. Um, and then the other one was for the installation of underground utilities and similar types of connections that don't change the grade. One of the points was, well, how do we deal with a stormwater fault? We can't, we can't grade more than, I, I can't remember what the number is, say 10 feet or something, and say we need to go down 20 feet for a stormwater fault, what do we do? Well, so what we did was we changed the rule to say that, um, that if you're doing an underground utility installation, which doesn't change the, the surface elevation, that it's exempt from that restriction. So those were two adjustments that were made. So we're inching towards what you're talking about. Um, and maybe there's some additional refinements that can be made to that. I guess one other refinement I'd just suggest you add, at least for consideration, is the size of the, the development taking place because mass grading over a larger space only gets worse and worse and worse. If it's a smaller space, you know, if it's a, a one acre or two acre parcel that's being built, um, you know, there's less opportunity, frankly, to just do mass grading that causes damage. <coughs> so there may be some ability to say on a smaller parcel, you can make some adjustments to make it work. Not this, right? Not, not what we're seeing in this kind of a picture. Yeah. I think with our uh, forest uh, canopy plans that are coming up, that mass grading is going to become less of a, uh, uh, that they're not, not going to be able to do that as much, I would think. Uh, you can't even grade six inches around a Douglas fir without killing it, so I'm, I think that we're going to, I'm hoping that the forest canopy regulations will control some of this stuff that's going on right in the older neighborhoods with the big trees. Uh, a couple comments. I, I think this does a lot to kind of fight homogeneity again. I think it's the reason why they're doing why, why they're doing it is to get that predictability, which is not necessarily good for the community. Um, there are also technologies out there that allow kind of custom standard house plans, you know, where you, there's just, there's, um, I forget the terminology, but you can have custom floor plans while still maintaining the workflow of kind of a standard type construction process. And so there might be things coming online, you know, in the near future that, kind of help maintain some of this, uh, the benefits of this on the builder side without doing this. So did the development community seem like they can get around this? They don't, what is? The, the, the feeling was is it presented a 
fairly significant hardship is what my takeaway was in as compared to how they've been doing business and it would be a, a shake up to the way in which they design and build and cost out the, the construction costs for the projects and um, so we're, we're going to have to have some additional discussions and I'll definitely go back to the builders and you know, try and figure out what exactly about this is is the hardship so that we can better understand it. Um, yeah. I'd also like to know how the newest tree retention policy affects this. I mean, when you're talking to the developers, because I mean, this something like this photo is not. I'm guessing they're not dealing with the current tree retention policies. So yeah. So again, you know, we haven't seen as many construction right. projects hit the hit the ground that um, have applied the new tree rules. Those that we have seen in planning level review have been applying a bigger tree protection area. There's one that actually was built recently um, that was mass graded, but that also did a good job protecting trees was one that actually was um, in front of the city council for final plat, um, Iron Gate. You could take a look at that one. There's a massive tree protection tract, but they also were able to, uh, they also mass graded it. So it's it's a it's that one is seems like a balance where they were trying to retain the character along what is it 212 212 um in so you don't even know the project's there unless you turn the corner and you go around the corner and then there's a i want to say 300 400 feet of street frontage mm -hmm. and then the project is kind of a long project that goes back in um so if you take a look at that one, that's an example of the new tree rules being applied to a project um, and what that might look like. Uh, but it still utilized mass grading. So there's a question on balance of how does this all work? Right. Okay. I, it, sorry. Oh. Is it fair to say, sorry, Jane, um, that with the increase in regulations and certainly something like this will also lead to increase in house prices? That's, that's one I couldn't answer. Right. <laughs> I just wanted to. We did hear that from the you. development community that that is that will be one of the results of regulations like this. So that's what I did hear. Sure. Okay. I'm sure that it will be, and uh, I don't see how it could not increase house prices. But what about trade-offs like uh, triplexes and duplexes? Those uh, those all of a sudden give the builder back something uh, that. Uh, and it doesn't take it doesn't require more grading mm -hmm. it's a it's might be a trade-off if we could think of things like that and it would fit our housing strategy as a somewhat of a side note I'd really encourage a comment that um, part of this discussion needs to include erosion control during construction and stormwater management after the fact because if you keep more existing grade and topography than um, if they're doing some of this work in the wintertime around here, the erosion problems might kind of defeat some of the efforts we're making to try to make this better. And certainly we don't want our creeks, which we're spending money to improve, to have stuff dumped in them because of those problems. And then when we look at certain neighborhoods that we all know of right now that have water management problems and have for a long time because of poor planning, keeping more topography means there needs to be a bit more stringent engineering review to make sure that the stormwater management plan is better, not just cookie cutter that they can use on any flat site. So I wouldn't want to lose those two things in this discussion because I think they're very important. So the next one, and this is another big one, um, and then we get into the easy ones after this. Um, although I don't know that any of them are easy. Um, this one is density rounding. Uh, and in this case, um, with the, in, with the um, interim rules, we changed the rule from historically Sammamish had allowed rounding up. So if you had, uh, in this case, um, 4.52 units of density from the density calculation, you would get five units. And what this change does is it requires that you round down. Unless you achieve a whole unit, you have to take the lesser unit. So if you have 4.52, you get four. Um, and 
what this does is it it responds to areas where um, there might have been additional units being granted um, and the perception of density going up because there might have been an extra house built. Um, this is one that I heard from the building community is pretty impactful um, to projects. Um, and they the, the entire focus group that we held asked what this was stemming from. Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, perception around density, especially when you're clustering. You might have, say, a four acre property in the R4 that it grants you 16 units, just speaking of that, and you might get 17 because you had a little more than four acres. And then those 17 units are then clustered in one corner on 45 to 5,000 square foot lots, and the rest of the site is preserved to some degree. But those people that live right behind those new 17 units are now next to what would be the equivalent of like R20. So that's the concern is that it's an additional unit. It just adds to that density. Um, the question is, is this appropriate? Is this something that you think should be kept? Should we round up or round down? The focus group thought that we should round down for short plats and round up for subdivisions. Because with subdivisions, a larger number of units, you don't notice it as much. With smaller projects where you might have four units or five units, you definitely would notice it. Um, so that was something, and we actually heard from the development community that, that might be reasonable also. Is that what you said in the, uh, in our packet? I thought you had it reversed. I thought you were rounding uh, down for, um, down for subdivision short. and rounding up for short plat in the packet. So the city council recommended that we round up for short plats. One member of the city council recommended that we round up for short plats and we round down for subdivisions. But the focus group thought the opposite. The focus group thought the opposite. So. Focus group says down for short, up for long. And with the rounding, does it matter to what digits it, so if it's, is it like 4.5 you round up, 4.4 you round down? Yeah. Or is it even 4.99 you still round down? 4.99 you would round down under the rounding down scenario, yes. You could change that. Numerically, that's very easy. It's binary, you either get it or you don't. So if you wanted to set it at, you were within a quarter point, sure. You know, that's one way we could do it if you felt that that was more appropriate. Thanks. So I have this. It seems to me that most of our development is coming, uh, and I might be wrong, but with 85 to 90% of the town built out, we're getting developers coming in and buying up one house of uh, uh, that was zoned R1 under King County and now it's zoned R4. So they're coming in wanting to put four houses uh, where there used to be one. Is that quite common? Is that, would that be the most common type of development? That, that's a fairly common type of development or they might buy two or three houses next right. to each other and then right. put in 12 houses. That's, that's what I'm seeing. And so when I look at uh, 43,560 square feet and divide that by four, and then I, t I say, well, these old ones were probably horse acres. They probably weren't full acres. Is that right? 36,000, 37,000 square feet? In many cases, yes, because there were requirements for road, in road infrastructure. So when you take a, you know, a, a a block of land and you start to carve off some of the requirements for it, the piece that's left in private ownership is smaller because those public ownership components like roads uh, come out of that. Well, it even was a real estate thing. They could say an acre of land and then it would be in parentheses horse acre. And uh, people would think, they would just think they were getting an acre of land. <laughs> and uh, uh, so when I add that up, what I get on one of those lots is I get 3.3 possible units. So if you round down, you would get three. If you round up, you'd get four. Is that right? Only if you hit 3.5, right? Or do you have to hit 3.5 to get four? 3.51. 
to be exact. <laughs> it almost doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> so I have this idea. Um, being concerned with the efficient use of land, but still wanting to maintain character, and also talking about our whole housing diversity, or you know, mix of types of homes. I was wondering, and I talked to David about this, wondering if we might be able to do something where if you hit 4.5, there's sort of some incentive that you could build a smaller house, like an affordable unit, or you know, like a, like a half house, basically, if you're building a bunch of 5,000 square foot houses, you're, you could build that extra unit, but it'd have to be a 2,500 square foot unit, something like that. So it'd be more dynamic. Or what if we say you could build a duplex for one of the houses instead of, you know, some, just something where we can extract more use out of the land without, you know, without creating this uh, density, just the perception of high density. Just an idea. I like that idea. Yeah, me too. Um, I don't know how you. I don't know how you do it. Operationalize <laughs> it. I'm not sure, but yeah. I would also I say agree. I'm trying to figure out when I've thought through this, and I've heard actually this is the one I've heard the most comments from, from people in the community, and I'm I just struggle a little bit to see. To me, the person that it could be most affected by that I'm concerned about would be somebody who's had a piece of property in the community for 20, 30 years, and now their retirement plan or their college kids' college fund is to, to take that property and either sell it or develop it. And, uh, you know, if it, was, if it was me, which wouldn't necessarily be a fair way to do it, I'd say, okay, I'll round up for you. But if it's somebody who's coming in and just going to clear cut and build 50 houses, I'd go, yeah, we're rounding down for you. <laughs> so, I mean, I think there's some degree of there's this moral. It's not so it's not so obvious. And I'm struggling to understand exactly how much it really affects anybody. You know, a, a home builder that loses one house. I mean, that's that's something. But in an area where they're selling houses for a million dollars a piece, I'm having a hard time feeling huge empathy about that either, but but that could change in the future too. So mm -hmm. I guess this is one of the ones I'd say, David, that I'm struggling to understand what the real outcome actually is gonna be because I've heard different people's versions of it that are very different, right? Now this, because of, because of you know, um, parts of the property that you can't develop anyway, this is really not that much of an issue to, oh, this basically down zones the whole city. I'm having a hard time getting what the real actual impact of, of this change is. So I, if there's a way to, to get at that a little bit better, I think it'd be easier to evaluate, but that's at least my perspective on this one's a tough one. So, so for this one and, and a few of the other ones, I think a lot of it comes down to ripeness and whether or not the project is appropriate or whether they should try and get another piece of land. Um, you know, there's there's development all over the country, really. You know, I, th this area that I'm familiar with, where a, a, a property owner is trying to make a project work, but they can't quite make it work because they don't have control of enough land. And this this to us is a question around ripeness. You know, in and what we see sometimes is pressure to it doesn't you know it happens very infrequently, but pressure to to game it a little bit where someone might do a boundary line adjustment to grab a tenth of an acre and they get a whole get extra that. unit. Um, and it's kind of like, well, why didn't you just grab that whole other piece and develop the whole thing and make it whole? Um, and it's it just for us, this is something that becomes challenging because we we're, we're confronted regularly with the question from, it's not gamed that frequently, but we are confronted with the question around the, dense, the units of density um, one of the other things that we've seen infrequently but frequently enough to cause concern is where we're confronted with an applicant who is trying to get a public works deviation or adjustment of some kind, which would require a lesser standard of dedication of road and a smaller road. Um, and that what that does is if you run the density calculation, if you were required to do the full dedication and you were required to do the full public works standard, you would you would end up with with 4.49 units, but if you were granted a public works deviation from the standard and you were allowed to do a lesser standard, you might get 
4.55 units. So there, there then is the pressure for us to grant a, an, an exception to the rule, so to speak, and the effort behind that really, in, may, maybe it's purposeful, maybe it's not on the part of the applicant, but the result is, is they get a whole extra unit out of it. So th this right here causes a lot of tension in development because what's going on is it's a numbers game. If they can just get it up to 4.51, they get five. But and we've, we've seen surveys even, the, the whole premise behind a survey brought into question where we have two projects side by side and one project is, is claiming a certain point of bearing or basis of bearing, a whole other project is claiming a different basis of bearing, they don't get along. If you, take, if you take this project's basis, then this one loses a unit. You take this project's basis, then this one loses a unit. So this right here is that point of friction. So we're, we're yeah. I don't quite understand though, it, wouldn't this just change it from a break point of friction of 4.5 to a break point of friction of 5.0? Right. I mean, wouldn't all of those exact same things happen? Just, is there something that drives the lot side, the parcel sizes to be, I mean, whatever point in, in the math you choose, you're gonna have the same resulting activity of people trying to get from, you know, 4.95 to 5.02, they're gonna do the exact same thing versus now some projects are at the point of 4.49 trying to get to 4.5. Whatever the math is, it's the same yes, problem. Right? Yes, except that they're closer to the whole unit. In this scenario, they're at the half unit, so it's it's that perception. When you're when you're hovering around the whole unit, you're at the whole unit, so it's kind of like you're you're there anyway. So what's you know, it's the difference between a half unit and being being hovering around the half unit and being hovering around the whole unit. Okay. I like. Kind of. Oh, I'm sorry. I kind of. Am I talking too much? No, no. <laughs> Not at all. I. I like the idea that Shanna had, and that is if they're going to, let them round up, but have them give us the housing that we need to meet our comp plan. Have them give us either attached housing or small housing, affordable housing, mm -hmm. if, they, if they round up. And I don't see why, I kind of agree too with Mark, I, I feel like, you're picking on one guy and not the other. And um, I, I like keeping it all the same. I like it to be equal for everybody. I like the notion of ripe, of this ripeness thing too. I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I do like Shanna's idea about you know, you're allowing the developer to draw that value out of the land, but do it in a way that meets other goals, not just their goals, but the community goals. I think that's a one of those carrot stick type things I think that we should look to use a lot. Jenna, I like your idea too. I would also say that there's certain you know, parts of the city, and this kind of goes back to this this broader question, there's certain parts of the city that lend themselves to rounding up, and there's certain parts of the city that lend themselves to rounding down regardless of the size of the subdivision. So I think that you know, we, we have levers that we're not, mm -hmm. we don't have available to us that we're, I think we're wishing we did, but. The next one um, <laughs> is fences. Um, this well, is a I'm pretty sorry, simple um, one. I, I move we um, oh. extend the meeting till Probably. Larry. The second. Eight four, eight forty-five. Nine. Nine o'clock. Okay. Almost done with these. I second. There's a motion and a second to extend the meeting till nine. Uh, we have to account for a public comment. Oh, correct. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that. all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. Okay, so we'll extend the meeting to uh, nine o'clock. So this one um, is a pretty simple one. We've heard both positives and negatives about it. This is where we uh, allowed for an increase in the fence height from six feet to eight feet. So understand that the, the building code still controls that if you wanna go bigger than six feet, you would require a building permit. So we actually have not seen a single request for a fence over six feet yet. Um, and we don't anticipate getting a lot of them. 
but we have had some circumstances where due to grading and due to some changes being made in someone's backyard and adjacent property, the builder was even willing to build a bigger fence, but our rules wouldn't allow it. And someone's, someone's privacy was really being impacted by it. Um, so what this does is it allows in those instances where if you just could go a couple more feet and, and you'll, you'll possibly hear from some members of the audience about how tall eight feet is, we understand that. Um, however, we think it's a tool um, that is really an extra tool in the toolkit to allow somebody to restore their privacy in their rear yard when we are dealing with topographic differentials and they require a building permit. So there is plan review that goes into the design of the fence and how it's installed and it requires an inspection. So with that, the question is whether you think this is something that's a good tool to have in the code or not. So I have a question on that. Um, so I know you know you as a department have a lot of discretion on granting variances. So would this be potentially like could this potentially fall under that? So if somebody really wanted an eight foot fence, instead of having this new regulation, could you just grant a variance to them? You could, although that's a several thousand dollar process to run for the purpose of granting a couple extra feet of fence, um, and usually it's cost prohibitive. It would cost more to, to run the process than to build the fence. Okay, thanks. So from what you just described, could somebody come in and apply for an eight foot fence because they don't like their neighbor but have nothing to do with privacy <laughs> or, I guess I don't quite yes. understand. So, the, so that permit would be granted? Yes. I'm so opposed to that eight foot fence that you can't believe it. <laughs> I just, uh, we saw what that board that Mary Wichter brought in. And if you put that on somebody's property line, how do you expect someone to maintain the other side of it? Oh, Why can't we use vegetation uh, to, with the way things grow around here, they could have privacy in two years if they <laughs> buy the right thing. And it doesn't have to be pyramidalis. Uh, there's uh, uh, not only the maintenance issue, but there's the division issue and the wildlife issue, and we're trying to connect more. We're trying to see uh, across wider areas. We have such a convoluted little cellular development going on right now that this just makes it all the worse. And I think of the shade issues, what that eight feet would do to somebody's yard with our low sun angles. You couldn't have certain gardens. You couldn't grow certain things in your, in your yard if you were next door to that. It's a, it's a bad thing to live next door to. I'm all for eight feet, but eight feet should be at the building setback line. That's where it belongs. Would would both try to envision how this would work? But if one neighbor wants to build it and the other neighbor doesn't want to build it, how? Oh gosh! I mean, it be, does become to Jane's point. It does become kind of a forced on somebody shade their garden situation. Yeah. You kind of for, it feels like if that happens, then this the planning department or whoever is forced into becoming the arbiter between two neighbors, which we don't want to have happen. And how, how does that work between two neighbors? One. One simple solution might be to require an agreement between the two neighbors along the line of which the fence is being located that would be recorded on the titles of the property. Simple thing, other jurisdictions do this. It's not, it's not difficult and what it does is it requires that then any future bought purchaser of the property is aware that there was an agreement that was put in place. Um, note also with, these, with this rule change that we also downgraded the size of the fence in the front yard. So we were trying to think about neighborhood connectivity and how people relate to each other in their, in their area of, of interface in the front yard, but that in the backyard where somebody might want some personal privacy in the event of something going on, that they would be able to put up a taller fence. I guess just my follow-up would be, I kind of agree with Jane's perception that this is a massive thing. It, it's, it does create a pretty massive thing. Um, but there, I also can see that there may be instances where it might be appropriate, but I'd like to see if this was gonna be applied and approved, some more brackets around what those instances are. And I don't know what that might be, but grade differentials or there should be something that drives somebody to, to submit a permit request, not just 
you know, my neighbor walks around in their underwear, right? I mean, it's got to be something more than than that that drives the request for for this sort of thing because it is it's a massive thing when you when you stand next to a wall that tall outside. It's yeah, and this is the result of several comments that we received, and actually standing in people's backyards and looking at the scenario and what the range of tools were that were offered. And if this had been a tool that was available, it would have significantly changed someone's perception around the development going on behind them. So that's why we added it for consideration. I think I think it's I can see the need for it. Um, I do also see the concern, especially it has a lot to do with the yard setbacks. So if we had a 20 far, uh, a 15 foot side yard setback and you had an eight foot fence, it would feel much different than if you had a five foot side yard setback and an eight foot fence. So, um, you know, I think it's gotta be kind of related maybe somehow there. Um, just from a, I'm, I'm sure you guys have looked into this, uh, why it came to my mind, I'm not sure, but just the fire safety, there's a lot more mass of wood there. <laughs> and if the fence caught on fire, it could catch your house on fire. I mean, there's, other layers of concern that might come along, you know, if, depending on what the fence is made out of. So we'll, we'll take a look at those and bring them back, um, give you some, some options based on the comments here, and really appreciate the discussion on that one. Um, and in, a, in an effort of time, I'll move to the next one. This one is parking, and this one was a requirement that um, every new lot created through subdivision require one on-street parking space. Um, or the equivalent of one on-street parking space, and this might manifest itself in a homeowners association tr owned tract that has a parking lot on it that's managed by the HOA or something. And what it is is if you're having a party in your subdivision and you don't actually have parking on, it's signed no parking on both sides of the street, whereas where are your visitors going to park? One of the comments made by the, the, uh, the focus group was is that doesn't the public works standards address this? So we're gonna be looking into that because we have had a change in our public works standards. Consistent with the, the, the points I've made on the, some of the last ones, we haven't seen a lot of project, new projects be built under the new public works standards as of yet. So we don't haven't seen what that really looks like. So we're gonna to talk to public works. We, they were part of this discussion. Um, and we'll talk to them about whether or not actual implementation of today's public works standards would require enough street for parking, or if somebody could build a no parking street, um, and then there'd be nowhere for any guests to park. And if the answer is there is there is nowhere for any guests to park, that someone could do that, and that's a possibility, then we will likely come back with a, uh, a similar um, code, permanent code fix because we have heard in many divisions, such as this one, which appears to have a rolled curb, so it was probably a maybe a King County era project, um, but that, that this is um, something that's not acceptable in their neighborhoods, that they really wanna have some area for guests to park. Maybe it's a half, a, the equivalent of a half a car per lot created or something, but they do need some guest parking somewhere in the division. How does that work with a cul-de-sac? I guess I think of some areas right now where I, I'm pretty sure that the that the particular cul-de-sac doesn't provide wouldn't wouldn't meet this requirement in existing neighborhoods, and it would be pretty tough to do on a you know on the on the cul-de-sac as part of a larger neighborhood development. Sure, but that's not always going to be the case. Mm -hmm. So I don't quite understand how that might apply. Yes, yeah, so that that could it it, it could it occur in bald outs. It could occur in through design. Um, they could find places to put parking spaces. The question is how many. The question is whether it's really something that's needed. Um, you know, if you if it's needed on occasion, do we plan for the peak demand or do we plan for what the standard normal demand is? Right. If you're requiring that we plan for the peak demand, well, is that overbuilding? It, that, that's a great question. I do think that the instead of one, maybe some decimal number, some fractional allocation might might work better. But I would say. You know, one of the things that I think we want to make sure can't happen, and I'm not sure that this is the case in the city or not, is a situation where you end up with, um, whether it's somebody having a party or whatever, it's it's so narrow that only one vehicle can get through, right. and that creates safety issues. It creates a lot of problems that we don't want in our neighborhoods. So I think we need to just make sure that whatever we come up with, we avoid that situation. So David, where did this, this um zoning control come from like was that a, for to add more 
impervious surface, was this something that was requested by the community or is this like a big concern in newer developments? Where did this come from? It came from comment from neighbors that we hear on projects that are under review of you know a common comment is about how much traffic is going to be brought to the neighborhood as a result of the new development, whether it's a subdivision or something, right? And there, the comment is, even with a new single family home where we're doing like a reasonable use exception that requires a public comment period, we, we almost always hear comments around the addition of traffic and parking and those types of activities. So the, the issue here is making sure that, and in some instances, people are concerned because they might see a new design and they're looking at the new design and there's no way for anybody to park on the street in that new design, but their subdivision that they live in currently has street parking. So their concern is, is that the people from the new division are suddenly going to be parking on the street in their, in their division. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the haves and have nots and, and nobody seems to like anybody foreign parking in front of their house. It just is, it's the way of the world, I guess. So, the idea here is that you would you would have to account for parking for the anticipated users of the project within the project. I see this being more, and so when we have these narrow lots and these kind of long easements where there's several houses off of that, I see that being kind of a driver of this kind of concern and maybe if we solve some of those issues, this might kind of evaporate, perhaps. I think that's the next subject, actually. <laughs> yeah, go for it. So this next one is street frontage. Um, and this is a requirement through the interim regs that every new lot created in a subdivision has 30 feet of street frontage. <clears throat> and this is requirement that you have street presence. So similar to what Eric was saying, in this case, you would possibly have more on-street parking uh, because you would have more street frontage as compared to the project on the left. The project on the right, if the road was built properly to the right width and if driveways were spaced properly to stagger each other because what, what or to be aligned with each other, one of the issues we have is that if you stagger driveways and the road is not wide enough, you can't park opposite that driveway because somebody can't pull in and out. Um, so at, at least that's what I've been told by the person who lives across the street from me who gets upset if we park in front of her driveway. Um, right. So, so it's, it's this more of a practical use thing. Um, so in, in this case, um, if, you, if you had street frontage, you might have more parking on street. The other part of this one was is in relation to street presence and character and, and pattern. Um, so there are several things going on here. One is the usability of these shared use driveways um, and some of the things that we have to deal with in owning and managing um, relationships between neighbors. We get a lot of calls um, from people throughout the city who are disappointed with their neighbor. For some reason, they're blocking them in. They're not moving their trash cans. They're, they're wanting us to basically um, you know, broker a deal between them and their neighbor to fix the problem. Um, and that comes from usability of these projects that we inherit for the life cycle of the project. So whether or not it, you know it's functional, sure, but is it is it ideal, is it optimal, is it what we want? And that's the question. So we, we presented a, a potential code fix, which was an easy one, that every new lot created through a subdivision process or a short subdivision process requires 30 feet of street frontage on a public street. So one of the concerns I have about this is um, actually, if you look at the picture on the right, certainly around um, certain corners, you could end up with some, some parcels, some lots that don't have 30 feet, even though you're really agreeing, I mean, you're achieving what you want to achieve, but this is back to that kind of blunt force thing is that if you require every single one to be 30 feet, then you create some instances where it doesn't necessarily make perfect sense because of the layout of the of the subdivision or the development. Um, I don't know if there's a way to, to to allow for no more than you know some percent and five percent or some percentage or do something to create the room so that you don't end up then um, having to eliminate a house or do something strange that makes no sense just because of one or two 
parcels on the whole development. It, it just seems like that could conceivably be a little bit of an issue with some layouts. What if you, what if you said that the, on average, the lots in the division shall have 30 feet of Yeah, I furniture. get a little nervous about, I, th I think that's a nice way to talk about a lot of these things, but if really we mostly want 30 feet, then on average 30 feet means some get really far in the other direction. Some, I'm, I, I, I get where you're coming from, but I think that in order to achieve this, you have to say most are gonna be 30 feet or more or whatever number we decide on in the end but you have to allow for a few here and there around curves or at certain odd shaped parcels. They may not meet that, even though the whole rest of the neighborhood does. I don't know, that, that seems so, a little concerning to me. So it was pointed out during the focus group that the one on the left is not really achievable under today's public work standards because of the requirement of driveway separation. So that lot that's in the middle, sort of at the head of the cul-de-sac would not be able to have their driveway located next to that shared use driveway to the right, which is you know 10 feet from it or five feet from it as there's a separation requirement. So the design standards today are different. So this here is a representation of an older condition that we might have seen. Um, the, other, the other point is, that, so there's two parts to the question here is, do you think that every parcel created through subdivision should have to have direct ownership along a public street? That's a fundamental question there because that would inform the second question of, if so, how much? I think that's a bigger question actually right there. But, but just to finish what I was saying, I could see where, I'll just point to it. That one? That, that one probably does have 30, but you could certainly have situations where around a little bit tighter, more straight curve, they might not be able to get to 30. Everybody else does. Is that really a, I mean, is that really what the point of this is? I, I don't think so. So I'd be a little cautious about that. But I agree with your other point that the public versus private is a much bigger issue. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that as a commission, because that, that I think is one of the major points that I've heard from the development community is that it, it's that's a huge hardship is if they are not able to use one of the tools that's granted through the public work standards of use of a creation of a shared driveway tract that and we require that every parcel be anchored to the right of way by owning street frontage um, on the right of way that that is a hardship for the design designers and for the development because you end up in odd geometric scenarios where that's just infeasible. So I'm curious what the commission has to say about that or thoughts are on that. Well, it gets back to that ripeness thing, you know, it may not be, the time may not be right to subdivide it. You might need to add it to another piece of land to make the geometry all work out. Mm -hmm. I think um, when we, again, back to the community character, what kind of com community character are we trying to create? Are we trying to do the, where everyone has their decorations on the front porch and, you know, and you drive down and see them all, or are you gonna have these, is that what we want, or do we want these houses that are kind of tucked back in this dark shared driveway, and you don't know what's going on back in there, you know? Uh, that's kind of the, another base question, but you're, should we demand, or should we require they have some attachment to a public right-of-way? Um, I think it, it seems to support community character better. I'm more concerned with the hardship it, ha it would have on the homeowner and the neighborhood after the builder has walked away. What are we left with? And what will that HOA and what will all those neighbors have to deal with if, if there are garbage cans left at the end of this little cul-de-sac constantly because of various people's lifestyles, they don't manage to get out and pull them in on time. That creates friction between neighbors. And I'm more interested in that, this issue from that standpoint um, because we want people moving into these neighborhoods who are going to raise their children, be here 20, 30 years and develop relationships. And it's, it's difficult to meet your neighbors anyway because of the way we all live. But if, we're, if the only time we're going to meet our neighbors now is because we have an argument about whether you moved your garbage can or not, or whether that street can be plowed because, or will or will not be plowed w w during the, the winter months. And I think that's a bigger consideration, the long-term effects of these building codes and these building designs after the builders walked away, what are we left with? And certainly in my neighborhood, we've been left with kind of cleaning up issues that were left behind by the contractor. And I'm in my neighborhood 15 years now, we've only gotten to grips with that because homeowners associations 
are made up of volunteers and they come and go and they're active and then they're not active because people who, nobody wants to serve on that board anyway and people move away all the time. So it's very hard to get anything changed and, and trying to get neighbors to work together. So I think the less issues we can leave homeowners down the road with, the better, and it makes for a better community, it makes for happier neighbors, and I think that's where I would come from on that. Can I just ask a clarification question, though? Are we talking about, is this an issue of public versus private, or is this really an issue of design standards? Because a road that's built pr properly, whether it's public or private, is still way more functional, whether it's garbage cans or whatever, backing out of your driveway, than, like in this case, that's not built properly, in my opinion, on the left. That's just not right. So that's a design issue more than a public versus private, I, I think. Am I perceiving that wrong? Well, I, I think part of it, the public versus private part of it is with regard to services and how services are delivered, um, all the way down to how the mail truck delivers mail, where the mailboxes are, how the FedEx truck delivers a package. Um, I've heard all those things by talking to people over the years. Um, in this in this case, um, I I think that it the Public Works standard likely allowed that to be built, um, but those standards have changed. So again, it's a matter of while our Public Works staff were involved in our writing of these interim regs, I'm going to go back to them and have very specific targeted conversations around issues such as. Would our public work standards allow this to be built today? Or is there some other superior standard that, that a builder is subjected to um, where this would not be possible today? And if that's the answer, then I wanna know, well, what is, what is possible? Um, because we, we're trying to, we're thinking about it in terms of long term. How does the character of this play in? Um, and you, know, you think about patterns and you look at neighborhoods that you think are attractive to live in and we've heard from people that this is not something that's attractive and one of the comments that I heard from interviews with the focus group was that it, it, the feeling around development when asked about how do you feel about development in Sammamish one of the comments that I heard a few times was it feels like they're trying to cram houses in every nook and cranny possible in the city and it doesn't seem like there's any pattern or rhyme or reason and it's jeopardizing and impacting the character of the city. And that is the sentiment that I got from that. So this right here, this tool, while it's a tool in the toolkit that allows them to build out a property, the question is, is it ripe to build out? And the question is, is it appropriate to forego a future pattern that might be a better pattern in favor of using the, the what's in front of us right now? Um, so that's, that I think is, is really the, the root here is, is if this tool is something that is required, to require the street frontage, whatever size it might be, however however you average it, however you require it, is it something that will require ultimately a better pattern instead of let's just build what we can because we can't get the neighboring property, we can cram something in here, let's do it. That's sort of the, the reaction that I got from the, some of the members of the focus group versus what, is it a really thought out design and how it's laid out and is it promoting um, Good, you know, is do, does it constitute good, good quality design? I think when I think about st street frontage and the public and private, um, you know, access is uh, public safety, and you know, in in case of uh, emergency, can uh, the EMTs or the fire fire uh, fire trucks can they access? Uh, and then also, you know, sometimes when we get snow, is that service going to be provided, how, how, how does that affect the people who live there? So those are the things that, that sort of come to mind. And I just wanna make sure I understand street frontage correctly. So is that something that we're talking from the door of your house to the street? Is that what, what is meant by street frontage? It's the, it's the, po the corner points of the property that parallel the city's it's right of way. Okay, the city's right of way. So it's still there and it doesn't, like if we say 30 feet, it's from the edge of the home to, no. The boundaries. It's the boundary. So it's those red lines that are shown there? It's from like here to here, like in front of each house. Oh, like in front of each house. Oh, okay, all right. Right. Could I ask Thanks. a question about that uh, plan on the left? 
the two wings coming off the cul-de-sac, those are privately owned, aren't they? Yes. But, but if they were required to have 30 feet of frontage or 25 feet, you would never, am I right in understanding that? They would, you would never get that outcome. You would not. Whether it was public or private, as long as it's still required to be 30 feet, you would not get that outcome. It, it depends on whether it was, so that's a shared driveway standard versus a, a private street standard. So if you were to say, maybe maybe the medium ground is, is that you're required to have 30 feet of street frontage, whether it, yes. per public the definition private. of public work standard of street, that's public or private. Right. Yeah, I just worry that this one feels like it could have unintended consequences that we're not seeing yet because of the way a, a piece of property could get developed. Um, but if we enforce the right kinds of standards that come out of these other discussions, you should be able to eliminate the vast majority of the design issues that we see here. Now, that won't solve all of the service issues, I, I agree with that, but the design issues of creating space and, and not crowding people and you know that sort of thing should come out of what we've discussed in some of the other, other ideas, some of the other regulations. And I'll, I'll talk to Public Works about this before we come back um, and have some more information available on it. Um, so with time, I'm gonna move on to the next one. I think actually that's it. So um, quick recap, those other items added by the City Council on November 6th, as, the, as, as was discussed, they, they indicated they wanted us to round up for short plats and round down for long plats. Um, they asked that if we are doing, so one of the tools we have in the toolkit also is we have what's called an administrative adjustment of setbacks that allows through a building permit process, if there's some geometric condition or hardship or something going on on the property, we could actually make a decision through a building permit to adjust the setbacks. City council member asked us to include um, neighbor notification so that if, if you were gonna give someone an adjustment of a setback that the neighbors knew about it, um, so that, that, that seems reasonable. We're not talking a thousand foot radius, we're talking the immediate abutting neighbors. So that's a little different, um, a little easier to attain. Uh, the other one was, um, was a recommendation by a member of the audience who's actually here tonight, which requires um, a permit for any construction in defined critical areas. Our code is almost there after an analysis of that. It'd be an easy change to make. It's not something that's difficult. Um, and I think we agree with that one. Um, and, it, and then any additional changes that would benefit the city. So, you know, um, then- Maybe we can get back to you on those ones. <laughs> yeah, so then the other items add, added requested by the focus group were to round down for short subdivisions and round up for subdivisions. So the opposite of what the city council asked for. Um, mm -hmm. To look at the public work standards regarding street frontage and parking, which we talked about tonight, and I will be doing that. That's one of the things I'll be doing in background research before I come back to you. Um, provide tools for citizens to learn about the development process, such as vesting, um, the realization from the group that a subdivision could live a life cycle of 15 years and be protected under the rules of which it applied was fairly revealing to the group. Many people had no idea that was possible, and it told the story about why we're seeing the development today that, that looks the way it looks. Um, so we could put together a public info handout on that. That's not a problem. Um, the city needs to be open-minded to find strategies that retain character and allow for development and increase density. And I think that's something you're talking about tonight. So how do we achieve the outcome of density um, and character um, through diversity in, in some of the housing options that we're asking or we're looking, we're looking for? So that rounding up comment that, that Chair Collins made um, is a great one, for example. That's one that fits right into this. Um, the other is need to consider the impact of proposed regulation changes on housing costs. So if we're making changes, we need to think about, well, what's that really gonna do to housing costs here? Um, land values, those sorts of things. Um, building height and grading, consider adding some parameters to respond to the problems. And that I think is part of the conversation we've had tonight as well. Um, so we'll be doing some additional consideration about our grading, um, proposed grading changes and bring those back to you. Uh, so um, from the phone interview with the planning commissioners, some of the things that were asked were to clarify in non-conforming rules how the changes affect existing development, such as a home being built today versus one in 2016 or 2000. The question here is if we pass a bunch of regulations or change a bunch of regulations with regard to setbacks or how you measure building height and those kind of things, what happens to all the homes that are currently built? 
and our rules are fairly um, lenient with regard to almost all the cities in the Puget Sound region are fairly lenient regarding um, e existing legally established nonconformities. You, you know, you can tear it down and rebuild it. You can expand on it, those kind of things. So I could talk more about that at another meeting if you'd like. Um, I move to extend the meeting until 9.30. Second. There's a motion and a second to move the or extend the meeting to 9.30. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? We'll extend the meeting to 9.30. I would say one of my real concerns about this is it feels in a lot of ways like it's very focused on today's problem, which is overall development of new neighborhoods. But I really would like to think about a little bit how it applies to infill projects or to people who want to do something to add a bedroom onto their house or something that most of us would think was a fairly minor issue. And if you look around all their neighbors who've already done it and never had an issue, it, it seems like it's, I, I don't necessarily want to impose things on existing um, community members who want to make minor changes to their homes mm -hmm. and create a hardship because of new rules that are really actually focused on large developments. I just want to be cautious about how this gets applied to infill projects, existing homes, ADUs, all of the other things that may be future issues versus just the current issue, which is massive, you know, mass scale development. So if you'd like, I could include with the next meeting a brief presentation on how our non-conforming regulations work. So you'd understand that if we were to pass some changes to the permanent changes to the development regulations, how the, the, the population group you're talking about would be affected. That'd be great. Um, so uh, how do we fix problems of the past? How do we incorporate transit into development? Great questions. Um, um, how do we consider different land uses and adjacency issues to formulate variable and dynamic setbacks? Um, we need more dynamic regulations. Um, and then consider setbacks that are related to arterial streets. So we talked about that one tonight as well. Um, so in closure, um, we have two questions for you that we want you to think about. Um, and you can follow up with an email, a phone call if you want to. Um, really no more discussion needed. It's really just leaving with these questions. Should further changes to the existing zoning controls be considered? Um, so should we, in addition to the, that, uh, that range of changes that were made, should we make some additional changes? Um, I think we've talked about some tonight. We'll definitely go look, take a look at those and bring them back to you. Um, should other zoning controls be added to the list of those used by the city, such as, you know, one, one and this is one that I, <laughs> is more complex to administer, definitely, but an example is like Florida area ratios. Um, that I think is something that as we evolve as a city might become more important. But again, it's that question of it's the right, the right number of um, discretionary decision points in our review versus those that are binary decision points. Um, FAR, in my experience administering it, because I've done that in another city, is, is turns out to be pretty discretionary because it's question on how you calculate the, the area of the home. It's There's a whole bunch of things in there that are kind of squishy. It's not quite as binary as you'd like it to be. I do think, and I just mentioned this earlier, if we don't want to use some, some kind of tool like that, we should at least consider some of these to create some high, medium, low set points based on the size of the houses being built because I think there should be some less restrictive requirements on smaller homes and more restrictive requirements on larger homes. And that, that adds some complexity to it, but if you did it in a way that wasn't too much, you know, that's why I say maybe a three setting deal or something that made some sense, that, that could get at a lot of the goals we've talked about for character and housing affordability and, and so forth. And I think for me, uh, you know, when we look at all of these or any of these zoning controls, I think we really need to be very cognizant of the effect on the environment that we have. And I think that needs to be underlying consideration whenever we, um, you know, develop these new, new zoning controls. I was wondering if there's, if you could look into, you, you mentioned other things and, and, and maybe this isn't the time, but there was a like solar access type of, of way of approaching things that might be a, a, a simpler device that could lead to more uh, outcomes. I so, guess. so one of the tools that was used in conjunction with the jurisdiction where we applied Florida area ratios was daylight plane. And daylight plane was a tool where you could you could get an exception to 
uh, the Florida area ratio restriction if you could prove that you were providing a certain daylight plane to the adjacent properties around you. So it responded to what the ultimate problem was, which is solar access that some of the neighbors were citing. Right. Um, and, it, and it also scaled development. So if you allowed for a certain type of roof, you designed the house properly, you could get a little more than the 0.5 FAR allowed. Um, right. But if you didn't want to do that, then you had a you know an, an easy target of we'll just design it to 0.5 FAR. You know it's it's so it's a safety zone for a builder to know they can get that much out of it. Right. It'd be interesting to learn a little bit more about that approach. Um, and um, I guess I would just caution against or caution of trying to you know achieve these grander design goals with legislation. It's not always as easy as as we would hope, you know. So it's it's very challenging to do that. I would also was wondering if you could take some examples that we could give you or whatever and, and kind of show how these these negative examples we bring up often, how this that subdivision might look different if these types of measurements were put into place, you know, how would it how would it how would it impact it? I think it's powerful to have examples like that. And and examples, I mean, your your stripped down rectangle example was was helpful. Don't get me wrong, but seeing something more boots on the ground type of thing might be interesting. So we we have a couple shelf ready examples that we could bring back to you um, that we've already been through that exercise on, um, and it shows you. Like I was describing, that crossroads of lot coverage restriction versus setback restriction, and it shows you the delta where you sort of, it you know the setbacks become less important, and it's more a lot coverage restriction that's the thing that's driving, driving the lot size. Um, so, you know, we'd be happy to bring that back to you. Um, like Eric, I'm interested in the what is it called the light plane? Uh, yeah, what is it? Right. Yeah, light, light plane. plane. And FAR, and I'm not sure if FAR and this idea where you do the wedding cake, um, is it? So like some, some, some jurisdictions allow for exceptions to the FAR if you follow that type of design protocol. Okay. Um, but floor to area ratio is generally that you're required for the full volume of the house, the, the, flo the floor, floor areas as calculated per a formula with, with air exclusions because that's, that's where the complexity lies. And what if you have a half finished attic? Is that a? Floor, um, to the to the to the property size. So if you have an eight thousand square foot lot, you get four thousand square feet of floor space in the home. Okay. Um, so what that would do is, with many of the homes we're seeing here, if you set it at a point five, you're, you say you have a five thousand square foot house, it would require a ten thousand square foot lot. Um, okay. That's the consequence. That's the of concept. That. So I think I'm talking about um, sort of the second and maybe even third story setbacks. Is that how you characterize yep. it? Yeah, that would be that would be a um, design requirement that would allow for you to get um, some additional volume out of a house. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would be looking for less volume. I think. And I, I think it'd be. Am I, looking, am I? Am I explaining? I I, I thought I'm you said that my... one of the um I, I thought you at least suggested on the height um, regulation change that maybe you there was some language added to provide for facade kind of articulation so they couldn't just build a big blank wall. I, I that's what I'm that's talking about. That's kind of what I think yeah. Chair Collins is Added already to, we, we could bring it back. I could describe that in more detail the next meeting. Okay. I guess just overall sort of a block in dimensions look at a few of these things. Right, now I like the idea of having this kind of real stripped down, if, like you're saying, if you know, your FAR is this, but if you start modulating and start putting more effort into the design, then you get to go over some of these limits, but there's real value in doing some articulation and there's other values that are coming out of that. So I think allowing one to go over the otherwise maximum, if you just kind of do it simple and dumb, this is what you get, but you start putting more effort into it, you get to do a little bit more. I think that could achieve a number of goals too. Uh, if I got the last Go comment here, yeah. I think my my whole deal <laughs> has been uh, how much I really dislike that broad brush zoning map and how we implement it. And I I just think that that's the root of all evil in Sammamish. And is there any hope in the future that 
is anybody working on getting rid of that and getting a more detailed way of looking at things, more control? So that would be something that we would have to be directed by the city council to take up as a work plan item. Um, I hear what you're saying. You know, there's different ways to administer zoning, and, and it really depends on what um, we're being asked to do. So um, I'm not aware of that currently as a work plan item um, in our short-term work plan. Um, so if that's something that was wanted to be elevated, it would be take really requests from the city council for us to add that to our work plan, given that we have all this other work going on, and that's a, a fairly complex um, costly endeavor. Um, the question is whether you know that's something that takes priority over the other stuff we already have on the work plan. It seems that other communities our size have a more detailed, better zoning plan than we do. And so uh, ours seems extremely simple. And when we want to increase numbers, all we do is take R4 and push it up to R6. And uh, I'm offended by that, and I think that's why we get the look we get. Okay, we better do public comment. So the next item of business is public comment. And I'll take the first person on the list is Karen Herring, but I'm afraid she may have left. Yeah, sorry, Karen. And the next person on the list is Jeff Peterson. And thank you all for waiting through that very long discussion. Do you want to start over? You do okay. whatever you feel like. So uh, just, I'll just say great, great job by you guys tonight. Thanks for staying late. Dave, um, good job on, on presenting kind of the major overviews of the, of the focus group and, and thanks for the opportunity to participate in that. Um, I did think, you know, the other people that, that were in the group, we had a really good conversation. It, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of friction in the group. Um, so I, I think we did agree on a, on a number of topics. Um, I'll just quickly run through what I saw um, that maybe Dave didn't touch upon. Um, on the density rounding issue, it is a balancing act because if you have a, a small homeowner who's, you know, I guess the worst situation is you've got 1.5 you know, units, that makes a bigger impact on his neighbors to go to two, but it also has a bigger financial impact on what he's able to value his property at. So it is really a trade-off. Um, and I don't know that there's going to be a great answer to that. Um, uh, on setbacks, um, you know, well, let me run one more thing through on the, on the density rounding. Um, the last project that I got through PPLAT with Sammamish um, took me about two and a half years to get through the PPLAT process. So I invested back to January uh, 2016 and it just got submitted for engineering now. So an idea of how long that process just takes to get through. Um, on top of that, that project ended up with a net 42% zoning. Um, and while it's probably easier on the neighborhoods to, to put your buffers on the outside, that one had some critical areas were right in the middle of the project. It was just shy of a 15 acre project and you know, those were really important. So that's where the trees got put, that's where all the, all the critical areas got preserved, and unfortunately we're, we're close to neighbors on the outside and perimeter of the plat. But to further reduce zoning, or further reduce the yield on that, been no value for the underlying sellers. At some, at some point there's those trade-offs, and they're trade-offs. Um, in, in relation to setbacks, um, just 
be aware of the, the example that's shown on page 36. I looked at those plots. I think they're 1996 era plots. Um, might be even older than that, but so they're reflective of some really old zoning. But even in those, you can see that, that in the cul-de-sac lots, you're still looking at these 10 foot separations between houses. You push that to 20, it has a huge effect on the cul-de-sac lot. It has a few, huge effect on knuckles and things like that. So um, we, we just haven't seen that, that 5, 7, 15 rule play into effect on those, those separations. Um, I think that's gonna make a big difference. Increasing that, that space between houses increases road impervious per unit, if you look at it that way. Um, sidewalk, um, all your utilities get longer. At some point, it becomes untenable to build it financially. So it's probably not right there, but it just gets worse and worse the more wasted space that, that comes into, into play there. So um, if you wanna do something that's like a, you know, you, you have a certain setback at a certain level and it steps in and steps in. It's more expensive to build, but it might give you some of the character things you're looking for. I, I think you do need to dive into it and, and see what comes of a, maybe not a quick and easy solution that we can just draw a box on every lot and go, that's what I can build in and it can run, run through the, the department and then go, yep, that's good and pass it on. Um, I, if you wanna build character, it's gonna be more complex than that, so. Um, Building height and facade, I think it kind of plays into that. We talked a lot in the group about making sure that the transition areas to the existing development are addressed. But it's not a concern on the inside, where if you have a larger project and lots internal to that project, we don't really care what that difference is house to house. We're managing that, we're developing that, and since a lot of what we're doing now is infill, we're dealing with some really weird, you know, you, you take two or three lots and you combine them, you got these weird different houses that were set at different heights back in the 60s and 70s with rockeries and you got a house that is now sitting on top of where an old rockery was and there's eight feet of difference between what your you know, original grade was on that lot. It becomes really difficult to manage. So you know, on the inside lot, not a problem. On the outside lot, maybe, maybe we need to do more there. Um, limiting mass grading. Uh, Dave, Dave was right on, flow and sewers and utilities. The other aspect of that is, is when we cut in those roads and we cut in those utilities, there's a lot of export that has to happen at that point with that material because we're not gonna put topsoil back down underneath the road. So if we don't have the ability to use that in other areas of the project and we've gotta ship it all off and we can't touch the rest of the project, we're only allowed to put roads and utilities in, that's all getting in loaded into trucks and it's gotta get driven out of some ambush some more. So that increases, huge, huge increases on what the cost of development is. Um, and it's not, it's not a very good thing for the environment or the balancing of the dirt on that site. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the dirt to balance on the site with the constraints of the roads and lot sizes and that thing. Um, so that's kind of the goal. It's, it's not so much the stamp, stamp, stamp. It's we're trying to balance out the, the dirt loads in the project. Um, parking, it, we discussed it, it wasn't debated extensively. Um, I'd look at the new road standards because the, the new road standards do require a, a lane um, on non-arterial streets for parking. Um, street frontage, a bit of a bigger issue for us and it does come down to that private public. So if you do have like a small four lot short plat and you're gonna do a, a private road into that to serve four lots, now it's a public road you're going from 28 feet wide to a 60 foot wide right away. And that has a huge impact on density. So um, that's my thoughts. And if you got any questions on anything we did in there, be happy to answer. Thank you very much for coming and for your comment. Oh, yes, probably. Todd Levitt. Oh. <laughs> hey, good evening, uh, Todd Levitt. Uh, with Mari Franklin, 14410 Bell Red Road, Bellevue, Washington. So David, uh, Dave, by the way, would you mind uh, pulling up the slide or, or somebody over there, the PowerPoint that showed the uh, tracks that Jeff was just talking about versus, um, you know, lots uh, on public right of way. I'm gonna come back to that slide in a sec. Uh, David had started off his uh, presentation with the night of September 18th. 
If you guys were aware what happened that night, there was some other significant event that happened that night. The moratorium was lifted about an hour and a half, uh, about 10.30 that evening uh, for building. And so think about it, uh, growing up I loved watching cartoons. You know, Bugs Bunny, Woody Woodpecker was my favorite. If you remember some of those old cartoons, there would be a hose flowing, right? And the cartoon character essentially put their hand on that hose and it would back up into a big bubble, right? All of a sudden the hose is backing up, backing up, and you know, it's a cartoon. And so you think of that for the last year, that's probably what should have been happening for potential land projects to move forward. They couldn't move forward because there was a moratorium. So you think, you put that hand on that hose and it's building, that big bubble's building. And then uh, ultimately when that cartoon character lets go, the water flows, he flies all over the place in the cartoon. Well, on September 19th, that didn't happen. September 20th, that didn't happen. Folks, I think it's, it's December 13th. That still hasn't happened. As of last Thursday, there has been one pre-app filed with the city on these um, new interim development regulations and zero, zero formal applications, zero. And I would tell you, when that hand was on the hose, we were, we were one of many builders, we're Murray Franklin, many builders out there who were lining up properties to move forward on. And we couldn't, we had seven at least lined up, ready to go. And so what changed? Did the Dow plummet here the last three months? Did um, you know, the, the real estate market collapse? Is Bank of America going under? No, it hasn't happened. What's happened is the interim development regulations. And so for the last 15 months, right, 12 months of the moratorium and now three months in, uh, with these interim development regulations, we developers, builders can't move forward on any piece of property uh, because these have devalued property, property tremendously, at least 30 to 40%, uh, along with increasing costs on the grading. And I'll break it down a little bit, uh, a little bit more detail on how that's about, uh, how that came about. I know David had mentioned uh, the city has done some layouts, taking existing product with these new development regs and seeing uh, very little movement in densities. Well, we took ex three existing projects. We have civil engineers who work with us. We work with CAD every day. We work with the city's codes day in, day out. And we took three existing projects we've built in the city in the last uh, three years. And there was at least a 25 to 30% decrease between R4 and R6 properties that we laid out with these new interim development regs. Essentially, R4 has become R2.9, R6 has become R3.9, R4. R and so why is that? What, what's driving that? Well, when you create uh, greater setbacks, that's going to create, you know, uh, much harder to achieve density. When you, you know, you take away the uh, private tracks access, it's going to decrease density. And, you know, you guys annexed, you know, incorporated back in 1999. You became, you know, the stewards uh, as a commission, as uh, a city, to be responsible for the development of R4, R6, R8 properties to, you know, you, you guys have a certain amount of units you guys have to deliver uh, being in the GMA. And so when we saw this, this was obviously a tremendous impact, uh, you know, projected impact, um, you know, to, to achieve those future, uh, you know, densities out of, you know, R4, R6, R8 zones. And then you talk to property owners right now, and, and that groundswell is happening. If you haven't heard it, it's happening. They can't sell their property. Their property cannot develop based on these interim development regulations. And oh, by the way, let's not even talk about concurrency. That one pre-app I mentioned earlier, that one pre-app I just heard today couldn't even get, it was a three lot short plat, failed concurrency. So if you can't even get out of these interim development regs, let's not even, you know, concurrency is a whole different discussion. So nothing's happened in the last 15 months. Right now, nothing in the foreseeable future is going to happen outside of the town center in any development that we can see as a builder or as, as a developer. Focusing in on you know these regulations, starting with the setbacks, so you have 20-foot side setbacks. There's no other city, no other city we could find in the King County area that uh, has 20-foot set side setbacks. The closest we could find combined is the city of Redmond, uh, which I thought I saw on one of the slides uh, a comment that the city of Redmond is, is doing good development or has you know is, is being viewed at as doing some good development from somebody's perspective. Um, you know, in regards to, you know, Commissioner uh, uh, O'Farrell, uh, did I see your name right? You had mentioned looking at these tracks, if you look up at the slide on the left, these private tracks, you know, this is, this is an important, uh, you know, path for design for us developers to help achieve some of these, you know, densities and designs. Well, you look like some of this, I know some of the concerns were garbage. 
I'm just taking one for example, right? Garbage is a problem. Completely agree. When you look at that design, where do you line up your garbage can? Well, did, you, did anybody look at maybe you create a pop out out of the right of way where the planter strip is and you create a line where people can walk out and put their garbage pail? I've seen it in many other communities. There's no reason a design like that could be considered. Talk about snow removal, HOA. You know, David had mentioned uh, that it's gonna cause more flag lots, more every lot has to line up to existing right of way. Well, you're gonna create long driveways now for these homeowners to maintain. No different than what these long drivers are, are these long driveways are being maintained now by three or four different homeowners. Power in numbers, whether the HOA maintains it, whether these owners, typically we have language, equal and undivided interest in the driveway. Typically, when you have power in numbers, there's an easier ability for an owner to maintain it, whether it's snow removal or general maintenance of the driveway. So all I'm trying to say is there's things that should be considered uh, and, and continue to be looked at before any rash decisions are being made because the proof is in the numbers, the reality that when those, like I said, that was building up, the market has still been robust the last year and nothing has been able to move forward. So you have to ask that hard question, why? What's happened? Well, we know what's happened. Just one more comment on the grading. Jeff mentioned it, when we look at mass grading, a developer looks at mass grading, I know I'm gonna time out if you can give me another 30 seconds. When you look at mass grading, we as a developer look at it in two ways. Number one, we don't want every dirt we move on that piece of property, we want to stay on that property. We want to be efficient. We don't want trucks hauling in and out of your city roads because we're going to be inefficient. That's money for us going in and out the door, and that's certainly, uh, um, you know, as constituents, you don't want to see all those trucks uh, running up and down those roads. And so that's part of it. And then the other part of it is we want the site to be able to flow. So we grade, right, when I say flow, sewer, storm has to be able to gravity off the site. So that's the, the, the fundamental premise when you start looking at mass grading. The concept of no mass grading and just uh, keeping the lots separate with uh, just grading the streets, you're really driving up costs there, uh, which again, it goes back to one of the commissioners said it, uh, pricing, right? What is the average price of a home right now in Sammamish? 1.4, 1.5, somewhere in there. Nothing that's being done here is gonna drive down that pricing. That's a problem. It's a problem for our future. It's a problem for your, our future kids, policemen, firemen, teachers. Gotta, gotta weigh all this. These are conversations I've been having quite a bit with council, and I'm glad for the first time I'm in front of you, and I'd be happy to uh, help you and work with you guys, as well as David knows and Mr. Thomas, through this process. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next person is Bill Patterson. David, do we need to extend again, or can we just keep going with public comment? I believe you need to extend, but you could extend to the end of public comment. Let's do that. <laughs> I move that we extend till the end of public comment. Second. In a second to extend to the end of public comment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say no. We'll extend to the end of public comment. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm Bill Patterson. I'm just a <coughs> interested uh, private citizen. Uh, David was nice enough to reach out, and I participated in the uh, focus group that was held uh, last week, if I remember correctly. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it, it just goes to show there's, uh, it, it's a great conundrum from the standpoint of finding the right balance between zoning rules and regs and what fits uh, a community from the standpoint of the needs of a private landowner, uh, a developer, a builder, uh, and it's no easy task. So it's, uh, there's no perfect solution. Uh, I might, uh, it was an eye opener to participate in the focus group because there was four people from the building and design uh, organizations uh, that participated as well as I think pri five private citizens. And it was an eye opener in regards to the uh, to learn about uh, the existing developments uh, that are in play now. And one of my comments to David when he reached out to me uh, initially was that, my Lord, there, it just, uh, it's, the city's inundated with development. And uh, it was a revelation to me to find out some of those had been in play for many, many years and were on hold and were permitted uh, on the basis of, I'm not gonna say outdated, but uh, the rules and regs that were in play when the permits were issued. So uh, this is a great opportunity, I think, for the Planning Commission in regards to coming up with some 
recommendations to the City Council uh, to either improve upon or uh, to add uh, some new uh, guide guidelines or rules or regs, whatever you want to call them. But keeping in mind there's got to be a fine balance between the people that, that uh, uh, develop, purchase, develop, and invest in regards to uh, uh, housing, whether it's uh, a short plaid or a, or a R6 or R8. But I, I might want to just interject that uh, to think about the future from the standpoint of existing zoning laws in regards to single family uh, dwellings uh, and what might happen with uh, uh, seniors such as myself that uh, uh, might move in with my uh, uh, offspring uh, from the standpoint of uh, uh, green housing, from the standpoint of uh, green uh, uh, services, whether it's waste disposal or uh, water services. So it's a uh, it's not an easy task, and I don't, uh, I don't envy your, uh, your uh, uh, task at hand, but uh, uh, just keep in mind that uh, for every action, there's a reaction, and we don't want to make Sammamish an enclave of, of, of an area that, that is unaffordable for uh, everyone to want to come and enjoy the, the amenities that this area has to offer. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, and thank you for participating. Um, yes, Mr. Stickney. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name Paul Stickney. I'm at uh, 22626 Northeast Inglewood Hill Road. I'll keep it short tonight. I think the answer lies in the overarching theme to optimize all land use by changing our comprehensive plan. As outlined in all the emails I've sent over the last you know, few weeks, and I'm gonna to talk to the city councilors about this because that's a call for them to make. Having said that, let me zero in on, on the meeting tonight. I echo what many in the public have said, very th thoughtful meeting, real good comments. I only have a few to add. I've heard a statement that there is a phrase, um, once is an aberration, uh, twice is a, a coincidence, and three, four, five, six times is a real pattern that you can sink your you know, uh, teeth into. I suggest that the city staff does uh, two things. I suggest that we take between three and, and 10 plats that were created from the 2013 to 2016 range and start with how many, how many lots they got, apply the changes that were made in 2016 to those plats and how many lots would have have been achieved and apply these 2018 interim regs to that and have a, a matrix that shows the evolution of how many net lots would be had within in the city. And I also agree with the staff comments that every, and then I have a, a second idea. I agree that every city has a complex, if you want to call it that, but they do have a sort of a collective or a cumulative effect of all their land use regs. It would be interesting on two or three Sammamish um, um, plats if we applied what would all of Redmond's regulations be to those plats if, if they were our regulations, or is a qua. Oh, so rather than worrying about each item, how do they cumulatively affect our neighboring peer city? So I think those two sets of information would really help your uh, current cause. And my last comment is that in regards to rounding 
and for example, on the 30 foot um, frontage on each lot, I suggest that you go to what we've been talking about during housing strategy and that I've been working on for a few years. For the types of housing that there are significant oversupplies of within our community based on, on economic and demographic groups versus housing supply that you round down and have the more strict standards. But on the types of housing that you have shortages of, which would take a, a needs analysis and knowing the gaps, and it would take you know, surveys to know the, the wants of people over time. But having, having that information in hand, in simple English, for the types of housing that internally within our city we have a significant oversupply, be hard on the regulation, round down, have the 30 feet. But on for, for, for housing types, which again circles back to my starting comment, it's time to optimize our supply. We need to not encourage continuing having a surplus of housing and, and adding to certain types of housing that we have an oversupply of internally. So have harder regs where there's oversupplies and more, more um, I don't know what the right word is, lenient, average, middle of the road, moderate regs where there are undersupplies. That can only be done by changing the comp plan to you know, optimize. And that can only be done by making informed choices on how much to optimize by just having the information. You know, what are the need gaps? What do people want from statistically valid surveys? What are all the pros and cons of you know, optimizing as opposed to staying with our current land use? What are the consequences, short and long term? And then, most important of all, what is fully informed public opinion, having all that information in hand as how the city can move forward and move from being much better than we used to be to you know, becoming the very best we can be by having optimal land use make everything in the city better. And I mean everything, the environment, social, money, region, people's lives over time, everything improves, all in the email sent. That's the comment. Thank you, Mr. Stickney. Mary Wichter. Hi, my name's Mary Wichter and I live at 408 208th Avenue Northeast. Thank you for extending the meeting for us. Um, just a couple things on the charts that David did a really excellent presentation of of 2013, 16, and 18. Um, it did used to have a maximum impervious surface for R4 and R6 at the bulk and mass meetings when Evan um, Maxim had been the senior planner. The reason they took those off is they decided that wasn't a tool for doing bulk and mass. There were other tools like the Maxim size. So if you're gonna switch out those again, I think you should put the maximum impervious surface again. The other reason you wanna do that is for redevelopment. If people build and then they build and they build, and they had a sport court and everything, you don't want the houses to exceed the capacity of the stormwater facilities because those are built for a certain number of houses in size. And then if redevelopment occurs or people add more, then the city owns the stormwater development, it's gonna to have to increase. So I think keeping a maximum impervious surface is probably a wise thing, and that should be re-put back in as you're doing the changes, and I just thought of that. Um, I did wanna just talk on fence heights. Uh, six feet is currently allowed, a lot of people use that. I do agree that there is a need in certain places for an eight foot fence, but I hope we would never see what David has drawn where the front is lower and it's eight feet, eight feet, eight feet, because I don't think anybody needs an entire yard surrounded by eight feet. My suggestions would be that 
you design developers how the houses are situated and where the windows are, and that kind of avoids the problem with the new homes. But if you've got problems that are currently existing, only allow that eight foot screen where you need it, maybe just by the window, maybe just on a portion of the yard. Don't make it a whole big fence thing that goes all the way along. Um, I think you need to consider vegetation and landscaping that can be used as a screen. Maybe you need the fence for a couple years and then it could be removed um, when there's something else put up. Um, I think that uh, you need to ask the people that are the abutting properties. They need to give input to it or they just get stuck with it. We don't want people who just come from New York and decide they want to put it up. I know somebody recently who moved from Pine Lake um, out to near where I live just because it was so dark in the house in Pine Lake, they needed a house with bigger windows because light's a really big thing. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say that I think having the eight foot tool is a thing, but it should be a tool. It could be six, six and a half, seven. It doesn't need to be eight feet. It should only be there. There should be a maintenance agreement with it. It should be able to be taken down and you should only use it exactly where you need it. Um, and if a setback on that person's property makes sense, that should be too. Um, as far as transitions, I think Jeff from Toll Brothers said it best. If you're doing a whole bunch of massive grading, you've got control of a big property, you can deal with the internal stuff. It's the transition areas to the outside. I see a lot of infill development where it's single houses on single lots. And a lot of times they're cutting next to the house next door and they're not thinking about what they're doing to the fence or stabilizing it. So um, through the things that I've seen in the past four years of researching, um, we really need to have clear and grading permits in critical areas. And the way our code is written is you get 50 cubic yards for free as an exemption. And that is supposed to be an exemption, but it's not supposed to be for critical areas. So that's about five dump trucks loads. Do you really want somebody doing five dump trucks loads without a permit? No, they need to have a permit. And then Evan Maxim also, when he was senior planner, he said once, he says, you need to have a threshold where you do something. And then what are the things you do when the threshold triggers? So I wanted to mention some of those. And I emailed in um, some stuff from Red where Redmond says any clearing or grading within a critical area or buffer of a critical area needs a clearing grade permit and any change of existing grade by four feet, not by five feet, because rock walls can go up to four feet before you need a permit. And then I also sent some things in from Bellevue and the Bellevue materials I highlighted, it's just excerpts. If you're gonna go to another property or offsite, you need to have a, a right of entry or a construction easement to do that. You need to look at the vegetation, the native vegetation, the native soils, um, how much is there. You need to have ground cover. You need to stabilize slopes. You need to look at the grading adjacent to you. You need to look at what you're doing with excavating in the fill. You need to look at when you cut a slope, how are you supporting that? What's happening with the utilities? The sewer and water need to be on your site plan. Your clearing limits need to be on your site plan. They need to be marked and they may not need to be not disturbed. You know, identify wells and septics in the area, that septics that used to exist, septics that are used now, and future drain fields, because you shouldn't affect the operation of those. If you are, you're in an area that is not so ripe for development, because the sewer isn't there, and you need to be careful of that. Um, but I just think there's a lot of things, and instead of me, who's just a person trying to tell what to do, I thought Bellevue had some good examples, and I know David used to work at Bellevue, um, and I don't know if any or all the words are needed, but I highlighted a bunch of things. Um, and then uh, just for other things, if you can clear and grade without a permit or if something is over clear and graded or if you start a project and you kind of never have finished, you end up with lots that just sit for one, two, three, five, ten years. They're cleared, the trees are gone, there's no vegetative cover, there's no grass put down, the erosion control isn't done anymore, and those lots sit, and I've seen them, there's a multiple of them, they're even in public view. So um, about two years ago, I had written in something to Kathy Huckabee, who had um, talked with the esteemed Jeff Thomas, and he talked about having abatement and abandonment, and apparently, um, like whenever the city has a code violation, they collect funds, and then those funds, I guess, just go back into the general fund. But city council could decide that they would take that money and put it in a special fund, an abatement abandonment fund, and then those could be used to help with situations where something's been done legally or illegally and needs to be recovered from. Um, and it could be a small amount of money or a large amount of money, and Jeff related to me at that nice potluck that you had, that I think there was $94,000 and $55,000 paid in tree fines since 2000. 
2015, so that would be like $150,000. So instead of that going back into the general fund, it could be used in abatement and abandonment. And that way, like there was an eyesore lot, I'll call it, going up Inglewood Hill Road where it just sat there, it was cleared, it had blackberries, there was a big orange digger that sat there for years, it was eroding. There is a house getting built there now because you finally did the stormwater project for Inglewood. But I mean, that just literally was one of the major intersections and I think for seven to 10 years, it just sat there. So we do have those in the city. It does not draw good things. It's not good for wildlife. It's not good for the environment. So I think having something like that would be really good. So um, I thought it was excellent presentation, excellent um, examples. And at the end, he asked for other things that could be considered while we're doing the interim development regulations. So hopefully I've given you an idea on some of those based on the experience I've had with stormwater and where I live. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak tonight? Okay, all I need is a motion to adjourn. Our public comment is over. <laughs> Sorry about that. I make a motion we adjourn. Second. There's a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. We are adjourned at 944.